Let's assume the attitude of prayer. Most gracious and almighty Father, we come once again to thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings that are bestowed upon us for this opportunity to continue to serve this great city. We ask the Lord that all of our decisions be ripened with wisdom for the benefit of, the, of our residents. This we pray in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The fact of the day. On February 1st, 1790, the very first session of the U.S. Supreme Court convenes in the Royal Exchange Building in New York City's Broad Street with Chief Justice John Jay of New York presiding. The U.S. Supreme Court was established by Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution, which took effect on March 17, March 1789. The Constitution granted the Supreme Court ultimate jurisdiction over all laws, especially those which constitutionality was an issue. In September 1789, the <clears throat> The Judiciary Act was passed, implementing Article III by providing for six justices who would serve on the Supreme Court for life. The same day, President George Washington appointed the justices, and two days later, all six appointments were confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Back to the day. Okay. Minutes, any... Additions, subtractions? If not, look for motion to approve the minutes as read. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Becker. Second. Second by Commissioner Nesta. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, agenda review. Edward. No changes, Mayor. No changes. All right. Okay, consent agenda. We've got nine items on the consent agenda. Anybody need to pull any of those items? If not, we'll look for a motion to approve the nine items on consent. So, so moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, crossroads at Kelly Park, phase three, major development plan. Gene? Jean Sanchez with the Community Development Department. This is a request to accept the first reading of the, I'm sorry, to approve the crossroads at Kelly Park Phase 3, formerly known as Kelly Park South Major Development Plan. The subject property is located at 4303 and 4405 West Kelly Park Road, north of Kelly Park Road, east of Round Lake Road, and west of Effie Road within the Kelly Park Interchange Form Based Code area. The master plan, the accompanied rezoning ordinance number 2946 for this property was approved on September 7, 2022. The applicant is requesting approval of the crossroads at Kelly Park Phase 3 MDP, proposing the development of 95 single family residences and future development of 350 multifamily units and commercial uses. 37 single-family residential units will have a typical lot width of 56 feet, and 58 single-family units will have a minimum lot width of 40 feet. The residential units will have a minimum living area of 1,200 square feet, and those with a minimum lot of 40, a lot width of 40 feet will, have, will be rear-loaded. The multifamily and commercial portions will undergo separate development review processes. The proposed access for this project is on Kelly Park Road via the Spine Road to the south and an on-ditch road to the north. 
cross access will be stubbed out in locations to the east and south to be connected adjacent to adjacent mm -hmm. future development. The DRC recommends approval at its meeting on January 10th, 2023, Planning Commission on a four to one vote recommended approval of the crossroads of Kelly Park phase three major development plan. The recommended motion is to approve the major development plan subject to the findings of the staff report. Staff and applicant are available for questions. Any questions for Jean? There was a four to one on the PMC and what was the descending vote? The descending boat vote was due to uh, the Kelly Park Road um, right now is not currently widened. Um, they didn't believe it supported um, the traffic that would come with this development. Can we, can we have, can we have um, well, I was just gonna ask, I guess, what's our response to that then? Yeah. I'll, um, I'll ask uh, our transportation planner, <laughs> Pam Richmond, to address. Oh, I know the, we've got the, we've got the, the plan. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, next, is that the one that yes. we're going to have yep. on? Uh, the plan to widen Kelly right. Park Road. Yes. No, well, the whole, the whole Kelly Park interchange road improvements. We've got that next, what day is that? It's Tuesday. Tuesday. Seven, yes. Ten. So next Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we should, we're going to go over all the road improvements, including, why don't you just list the, the roads, Pam, just, um, that we're, we're, we'll be entertaining. At the workshop, we're gonna lay out the master plan. The, the roads, there are two layers of roads. There's Kelly Park, Sadler, um, Golden Gem, Effie. Those are the roads that you know the names on. And then there's another whole Inter network of roads Internal. that are being covered. At the workshop, <clears throat> you're going to see all those roads. You're gonna see the plan. You're going to see the partnership. You're going to see the framework of the pioneering agreement, which lays out the funding strategy and the timeline. So that is what we will be uh, workshopping on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pam. And that plan isn't finalized yet, correct? The pioneering agreement? The pioneering is agreement, we have the framework. We're close to the draft. Okay. But I have five or six willing partners we figured out a way to fund in a short time frame $40 million worth of roadway infrastructure. So that's why I, I, I want to lay it out in the workshop when we have time to um, look at everything, answer all your questions. And when our a pioneering, or pioneering agreement partners are here, they can, most of them are going to want to stand up and tell you about their respective developments and um, what their particular part is and, and why this is going to work. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Thank Pam you. or Jean? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Come on down. Albert McKimmy, 3603 Golden Gem Road, Apopka. Uh, at the last annexation meeting, uh, I'm indebted to uh, Chief McKinley for giving us some accurate facts. Facts that unfortunately the city commissioners and Jim Hitt haven't been able to give me recently. At that particular meeting, uh, it was reported to us that there were 27,000 uh, potential new residents coming to Apopka. That was on the chief's information which he drew from, which was before another five or 6,000 homes had been completed. So instead of the 27,000 that the chief reported, I'm, my contention is there's another 15,000 homes to go in. They're all in that area that you're speaking about today. So we have over 50% of a discrepancy in what you're projecting your budgets on and what's actually going on just now. I continuously come down here and ask at what point city commissioners are going to accept the fact that there's a problem with the numbers that have given. I think it was at the beginning of December, Mr. Hitt reported that he had an $80,000 budget that was involved in actually producing the correct figures for what's happening in this area just now. The figures were going to be for the end of the year figures. So what I'm asking the commissioners to do is to refrain from making any decisions until this uh, workshop has been looked at and to see whether we can actually sustain the development on Golden Gem Road. 
you know, it seems unfair that you continuously prioritize projects that are going to develop other parts and provide comfort for them. Whereas on Golden Gem Road, we've been this way for a number of years. I know for a fact some of you have seen the, 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 the terrible uh, effects of the, 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 the sand and dust and all sorts of things that's going on. At the last meeting, I said to you, Golden Gem Road is two miles long. It's double yellow lines down all the way. It's only enough room for one lane of traffic. You can't overtake a pedestrian, can't overtake a bicycle. At what point are you guys going to give us some comfort and deal with the immediate things that affect us rather than continuously put us on the back list and, 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 and give more homes? You know, 6,000 new homes on Golden Jam Road, to me, is ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up. Yeah. <clears throat> and to go over that point, um, <clears throat> You know, again, it's it's a it's a timing and pacing thing for sure. Um, Mr. Hitt, you had provided the council on Thursday of last week some numbers, and so just let me let me read it into public record just so that we're all aligned in terms of what those numbers are. Um, in 2018, in terms of completed certificates of occupancy issued through your department, in 2018 there was 294. In 2019, there was 343. In 2020, there was 396. In 2021, there was 760. In 2022, there was 500. Um, so again, within the realm and margin of error, you're talking, let, let's just call it 500, even though that's above average for the years prior to 2020. So 500 COs per year and I think to Chief McKinley, what he was reporting during the annexation workshop is on average, uh, dwelling units within the city of Apopka average three people for per dwelling unit. So on average, if you extrapolate that out, it's 1,500 people a year. Um, to, you know, having that number in play, that's you know, our expectation or my expectation is, you know, obviously during budget session, budget season, which starts at the staff level in March or April of every year, is that those that, that pacing of new residents and new structure are going into the analysis that they're doing to set their budgets. If that's not happening, Mr. McKimmy is absolutely right um, because we've got to make sure that we've got the, the resources to be able to account for that growth. However, I don't subscribe to the fact that we're able to kind of crank through and you know we're going to have 20,000 people over the next year or two years. It's going to be more of a staggered growth. But but again, those those pressures increase if our development community wants to accelerate that, that construction, then it's a finite capacity issue that we've always talked about. You have finite resources within your department to go over permitting, to go do site inspections, to issue those COs. So unless you staff up or contract that service out, that 500 give or take is not gonna go materially higher or lower than that number, I would suspect. Um, if it does with the same resources, then I would assume that quality is going down. Um, so this absolutely has to be contemplated as we're, as we're considering things. And I, it's a relevant, it's a relevant point and you know, it's my call to action for staff to make sure that they're doing that during budget, budget season. <clears throat> Sorry. Dennis New 105 West Magnolia. Here comes another development built on two lane roads. Today is the first time I've heard anything about a transportation plan and it pertains specifically just to that area, not citywide. I'm sure the transportation plan for the city is out of date. The infrastructure plan is out of date. All of these two lane roads that we keep building more developments on are already overcrowded. The schools are above capacity. The fire department is still understaffed. The police department is understaffed. And I'm pretty sure that the other public works departments, the water department, the sewage department, and the others are understaffed. It's time to slow this down. You can call it a moratorium or whatever you want to, but it's time to slow it down until such time as our plans are in place and we've started towards the progress for the advancement that the city needs. Growth is inevitable. Why are we always 12 steps behind? Anybody else? Public comment? Okay. And I just have one other question for staff. Um, you know, obviously, the next two pieces of business are going to deal with uh, water uh, collection and, and routing. The, the new, this new um, piece of this particular development, is all of it flowing into that one 
uh, retention area or some of it flowing north to um, the larger uh, retention area that's already on property. More importantly, I just want assurances that it's able to function as it's designed. Right. Uh, good afternoon, Lance Bennett, Pulsom Bennett, the applicant. Um, the Can other, you speak just a little louder? Sir. Um, Lance Bennett, Pulsom Bennett, the applicant on, on, on the Crossroads project. The stormwater is split between the, the retention that you see here and there's a, a larger retention in the middle of the right. overall project site. Okay, so it is split in terms of its routing. Right. right. Okay. That's correct. And, and to address Kelly Park Road, this crossroads development did enter into a development agreement with the city to advance the four laning of Kelly Park Road. So that has commenced and is under design. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Anybody else from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve the major development plan for the crossroads at Kelly Park Phase 3. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Becker. Second. Second by Commissioner Nesta. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, emergency designation for public services. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Richard Earp, your city engineer, and so I have two items. Items number two and three on your agenda today. And uh, if it's all right, I'll just go ahead and, and explain what both of those items are. The first item is a request to authorize an emer the emergency designation for public services to procure the services of Ballinger Irrigation for the design, permitting, construction, and one year of maintenance of the alternative water supply irrigation pump projects that will serve the subdivision of subdivisions of Clear Lake Estates and Clear Lake Landings. Last Thursday, uh, Mayor Nelson, other senior staff, and I met with both homeowners association presidents to formulate a plan that was agreeable to the homeowners associations. The homeowners agreed upon approach is described in your package in more detail, but I'll hit the high points uh, here in, in, on the microphone, I guess. So the city uh, will fund Design permitting, uh, the city will fund the design, permitting, construction, and the maintenance of the alternative water supply irrigation pump project. At this time, the anticipated cost of the project is $600,000. The irrigation systems will be set up uh, so that they will be temporarily disconnected from the city's regional reclaimed water network although it will be possible to reconstruct the irrigation systems back to the city's reclaimed water network someday if and when Clear Lake is temporarily too low to use the lake as an alternative water supply. Uh, residential customers will continue to be charged for the reclaimed water usage uh, that's recorded by their water meters and billed at the uh, current uh, the city's established rates for reclaimed water. The Homeowners Association will not be charged for reclaim usage at this time for the HOA common areas. The idea is that the HOA will maximize the irrigation usage in the Homeowners Association common areas in an attempt to accelerate the lowering of the water in Clearwater Lake. The city needs to have easements from both Homeowners Association to access their private property to construct and maintain these systems. Both easement agreements for both of the homeowners associations stipulate that after five years, the city will analyze the potential, uh, analyze and potentially renegotiate the building approach cons uh, considering the reclaimed water usage, past reclaimed water bills, final costs associated with the setup and maintenance of the irrigation systems, of course, the level of Clearwater Lake at that time, and the city does to in, intend to recover all the setup costs associated with the uh, implementation of this alternative water supply project. As I mentioned, uh, both homeowner association presidents supported that plan, this plan uh, last week. On Monday, I understand that both homeowners associations conducted emergency meetings with their residents to discuss the proposed plans. 
And I others understand from both presidents that they let me know that the residents are also in support of this plan. Uh, also, uh, Clear Lake, I'll go, just go ahead and, and describe what number three is at the same time on your agenda. Number three is to authorize an emergency designation for public services to procure the services of stage door two for the design, permitting, construction, and operation of a temporary pump that will extract water from Clearwater Lake with the water discharging into the roadside ditch north of Lust Road, west of the 429. This ditch connects directly to the Lake Apopka North Shore Restoration Area. No flooding or other adverse impacts are anticipated to be caused by this temporary discharge of water from Clearwater Lake into the, into the North Shore Restoration Area. At this time, the estimated cost for this emergency operation is $200,000. The St. John's River Water Management District would need to authorize this emergency pumping. And um, the key elements that St. John's has let us know will be part of their permit is that the emergency pumping can be conducted for a maximum of 90 days. The pump to reduce the elevation of the lake, uh, the, the surface water of the lake would be reduced by no more than two feet. They still need, uh, they would need uh, all four private property owners around the lake would need to confirm their concurrence with the proposed pumping plan. Of course, two of the homeowners associations have said they're, uh, they're willing to sign these easements, and so that leaves Avian Point that would need to acknowledge they, they don't disagree with the lowering of the lake, and the, the, the single-family residents on the east side of the lake would also need to do the same. And this also, this second plan, the emergency pumping for $200,000 was also approved by both homeowners associations presidents and I understand their residents also supported it at their emergency meeting on Monday night. And I'm here for questions. Okay, questions for Richard. We'll kick things off. Um, yeah. <laughs> so again, the, the associations, I've received feedback from the association presidents, which is representative of the boards. Um, how does this work out? Just to make sure that we're all the T's are crossed, I's dotted. And obviously, that the association how does that trickle down to individual homeowner buy-in, or does that needed um, from a legal perspective? The continuation of the rate charging and stuff like that. We're covered there. I guess that would be a question for Mr. Rodriguez. Yeah, so on on this agreement that we're putting forth for both landings and estates, what, that's in our packet now. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of language around the associations. We've got an agreement and buyer in there, but obviously we bill people based off of their individual residence. Is, is that factored and covered within this agreement? It, it is. It, okay. it, it, it's basically, I mean, the agreement is really in order to provide access for the project we need, and you know, the access is going to be through the associations after such that's the you know our our infrastructure is already there there's really nothing changing so those prior obligations and agreements with the residents remain what is changing is the agreements we had to enter into the association to provide for the access as well as the water that is part of this new system is on association property it's not on the individual property owners so um it really doesn't affect the current relation uh, between the property owners and the city in regards to the receipt of reclaimed water. In terms of, um, you know, there's been some questions around liability and things like that. So uh, an example might be a, a kid plan that drinks the water out of the, these pipes. Does our indemnification language in that basically cover the city in terms of liability as it relates to someone drinking water out of the irrigation system? I mean, it's, it's going to fall, again, it's, it's there's no... The, the, the potential risk and liability doesn't change because the source of the water is changing. It's still part of our system, and the liabilities and risk remain the same for every resident of the city of Apopka that receives reclaimed water. So the, so as part of this agreement, we're, we're agreeing to the fact that the water is sufficient to be used for irrigation purposes and therefore would fall under that same liability. No, the umbrella. agreement provides for that, um, for the access and for the ability to, to do that connection. It does not go on, it does not go into any type of guarantee of water quality or any of that nature. It is simply this agreement allows for there to be access in the connection points to 
to be added to the reclaimed water system that's part of the citywide water what system. I, yeah, I guess what I'm getting at is we're not so. increasing or decreasing our liability exposure by entering into this. Agreement. Correct. Okay. Um, and then for the option three, I'm going to commingle thoughts here. So the option three piece of the, of the business. Um, so we're the right parties, city, St. John's Water Management, whomever has determined that the water is environmentally safe to vacate off of Clear Lake for that purpose. I just want to make sure from an environmental standpoint, we're all aligned in terms of not, again, introducing um, additional risk there. Yes, sir. The, wa the water is very, uh, it, it's high quality water uh, from what I understand. Uh, we, the mayor, I, I believe oh, yeah, some, uh, some water Sorry. quality test results were, were passed out. No, um, I didn't get it. Oh, I apologize. I uh, got it now. Yeah. So the... Uh, so yeah, the, the, the water is, is is good water. So uh, without looking at this, you're verbally telling me that what's on this paper is sufficient for us to not have concerns that it's going to be an, an environmental uh, liability. Glenn, why don't you come down just to speak to that? Yeah, we just we just got that the, this written report what today. So I'm sorry, we probably could have sent it out before, but. Good evening, Commissioners, Mayor Glenn Brooks, Water Resource Manager. Uh, to answer your question, Commissioner Becker, uh, the samples that was analyzed from uh, Clear Lake, it, it does meet all the standards that go to public access reuse. In fact, the standards that we're looking for here are the collar horn fecal, as you see, I think before you guys got, it's 4.1. You would expect to see some of that because you have no chlorine, you're not injecting chlorine. That was a lake sample that we grabbed. But the state standards, it says you can't have one sample over 25 parts per million. As you can see, that's 4.1. Total nitrogen, if you look, is a 0 0.546. Just so that you know, the state regulatory requirement for us to send out the public access reuse coming from our plant is a 10, it's got to be 10 parts per million or less. So it certainly falls within that category. And phosphorus is a number that they just are looking at. There's not a parameter where they say, well, there's a limit. And, uh, and as you can see, it's uh, actually that U means undetected 0 0.15. So on that, and then the TSS, you should have on the another page. Uh, That's the bottom of the page, 1.4. Yeah, total, yeah, total suspended solids is a 1.4 milligrams per liter or parts per million. Again, the TSS requirement going to public access reuse coming from our reuse plant to go to customers cannot exceed five parts per million, 5.0. And so we're certainly within that standard. So okay. with, the, with the sample that we grabbed, we're certainly within all the parameters to go out to uh, public access. Got it. Got it. Um, then the, we've, we've talked about the five-year kind of reconvene uh, timeline. In turn, sorry, I, I'm good on that okay. one. Um, in terms of like force majeure, if, if a sinkhole were to happen or water would come off that property quicker than anticipated within that five-year period because I don't think the the parameters around if we have to rehook into the reclaimed water system are really enumerated in the, in the contract but I think there's a paragraph in there that talks about cost incurred and we would be able to whatever cost is associated with hooking them back into irrigation that that will be contemplated and, and dealt with appropriately. To my understanding, I think, I mean, they're, they're, if I understand correctly, this, this, the two communities are not going to be permanently disconnected from the overall city just be connection. Neighbor. So if in the event that there's an emergency or some need arises, I mean, the switches can be made to put them back on the system to then repair or address any issues relating to the, the connection to the new source. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it, the, the overall big picture is what this agreement does is it creates a new source of reclaimed water for this community, which they will draw from, but the ability will still remain in the event of any exigent circumstances to disconnect this source and bring them back to the overall city source until whatever needs are addressed. And it really then becomes a case by case basis or you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And that's that leads to my last comment and I'll, I'll stop. <clears throat> the case by case nature of this, right? So I get, I get calls from residents who are concerned that live with zero interest within this community but are a taxpayer of the city. But I look at this as a case-by-case -case basis because it's a, a situation that's presenting real emergency situations for a lot of people involved. 
similar to what we did with uh, Lake Hammer. Um, there was a, that was a case by case basis where we did had to address an issue with water uh, levels and things like that. And so, you know, at the end of the day, the city's going to be made whole on this. Um, and I do think it's a reasonable allocation of city resources to address this issue. And again, I would assume uh, maybe just a general confirmation that the authority of this council is to be able to assess these things on a case by case basis, enter into these types of an agreement if we feel like it's for the best interest of our city as well as our taxpayers. Right. And as there, I don't believe there's any type of legal basis where this establishes a legal precedent right. that, I mean, you, you as a city council are not bound by stare decisis that you know, the courts are ruling on precedent. Um, this is a case by case. It's kind of similar in nature to when when the planning commission um, issues variances. Variances are really on individual case by case basis, and they do not establish a legal precedent that this council is bound to follow in the future. You're really taking every situation, all the facts on an individual basis, and then applying those facts to this situation and moving forward. The matters and issues and instances can change from from case to case, but you are not legally bound to follow a prior precedent. Um, you okay. really are going and making your decision based on the uh, issues and facts presented for you at that time. Good. Otherwise, I just thank the staff and thank the individual communities for participating. I'm sure we'll hear from other people, but uh, thank you for the time and energy that you all took to, to get back. And I know the last meeting was a little kind of heated, contentious, um, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Velasquez? Well, my concern was that at the last meeting, there was totally like the, the the community was totally against the same proposal. And then I have some concerns that the meeting between then and I guess Thursday the 26th, the meeting with the mayor, um, I don't know what was discussed, but it was the same proposal presented to them. And we went from, we were either going to do the the 200,000 for the emergency, and then we decided, well, it was discussed, I should say, that that really wouldn't have an impact to change the condition. Um, and I remember you, uh, uh, Richard, kind of saying, we were more considering the 600,000 package um, because it was an emergency situation. So I don't understand how we now are doing both. And then yesterday when I sat with the agenda review, um, you know, I have some concerns because we have gotten phone calls uh, from residents who are basically saying that we're using the utility reserves, which is something that all the taxpayers have contributed to. And I do understand the emergency that we need to address it. But what I'm wondering is, what changed? I mean, I have all these notes from the 18th where they were just not for it. Um, I, I think the only change is that, that they're willing to pay the, they're willing to accept the monthly billing of the usage of the alternate water because initially they didn't even want to do that. Um, am, am, am I mistaken? Just kind of tell me how the billing is working now. What's changing? What are we doing with this new proposal that wasn't offered the first time around? Well, Commissioner, the, I, I know there was a lot of discussion at the last city council meeting, and it, and it kind of jumped around. And, and I understood that the main thing that the council wanted was to sit down with the two presidents of the Homeowners Association and talk about all the options at hand. Right. And so when we did that, we came up with these two options that that I described. Um, again, with the irrigation option being that the residents would continue to pay at the, the city established uh, reclaimed water utility rates based on their metered usage, but that the homeowners association, at least during the, the five years uh, during this agreement, the homeowners association, during the times when, you know, two days a week, when, when the water management districts allows the HOA to irrigate, they're going to maximize that irrigation with the idea of using, uh, pumping water out of the, as much as water out of the lake as they can and putting it on the, uh, the common areas to hopefully reduce the lake even more. 
So that was the results of the discussion. So will they be? Will the HOA be paying for the common area? It, no, ma'am. Not during this five-year term of this agreement. Just the residents. Yes, ma'am. It's it's a small piece. I, Blanche, you remember it's less than ten percent. Is that would that be a? Yes, sir. a Okay. What was that number? I'm sorry, Blanche, would you come up? I remember you did a breakdown of what the residents pay annually and what the HOA pays, right? Yes. So how much was that? The HOA, I think, came to about 12000 and the residents about 117 annually, average. So this new agreement would, over the five-year period, would be paying back the reserves that they, that we are using in order to... In other costs, it, it, that's correct. The intent, as mentioned by Richard and as legal, is to recover all the costs. That's why we have the five-year period to come back and see where okay, we are. Okay, so I, I remember yesterday, 120 per year times five makes it 600000 Mm -hmm. And those are not hard numbers. That's what I understand. Correct. Those are averages over the last four years. Oh, this was an average of four years. Yes, ma'am. For both communities? Uh -huh. Yes. But we're not, the, then the HOA is not going to be paying the common area. Correct. For five for five years. Yes, ma'am. And you said that's about twelve thousand. Yes, ma'am. So at five years is how much? Is sixty. Sixty thousand. Yes. But we're approving an extra two hundred thousand. That is on the table for your consideration. So I, I mean I I want to help this community, but I don't want to do it off the taxpayers' back. I just, I've been told privately, I've been called, and I've actually been told it's irresponsible of our council to go ahead with this. Um, and they understand, those who have called me, understands the need, they understand that they need some kind of intervention, um, but they are also at the same time saying that we need to be good stewards. Correct. Um, and we have discussed this, and I know we've been going around and around in circles. So I'm, my understanding, why well, I would like to get, why was there a meeting on Thursday the 26th but then the HOA had an emergency meeting the following Monday. Mm -hmm. So was it the HOA that came to us to kind of go back over this uh, presentation or the proposal, or did we initiate the meeting? I mean, and then Monday they met with their uh, residents. Once you, have, have, once you have Brett come up, he can, he, uh, one of the homeowner association presidents come up and it was the on the meeting that you had with the mayor who initiated that was that done through here or was that you uh, the HOA coming to discuss this proposal again that was the city coming directly to us because of our request at that last meeting that we had requested to sit down at some point and discuss everything so on Thursday morning I believe it was um, Richard reached out directly to me and to Jeff, the president with uh, Clear Lake Estates, and requested us to have a meeting so that we could go back over everything, make sure that we're all on the same page, and have this to be able to be presented by today. And then you had the follow-up both? Correct, our follow-up meeting. So the last point that we had made is we wanted to try to keep this meeting from turning into the same thing that the last city council meeting made. So the comment that I made actually to the mayor was, You've done your portion of the job. Let us do ours. So we can take this back to the homeowners. We can keep these, you know, angry discussions out of council. So that way they understand everything that's been proposed, everything that we've discussed, 
and they're all in agreement with it before we decide to come to this meeting and move forward with it. So between the two Clear Lake Estates and Clear Lake Landings, you have 189 homeowners. Correct. How many showed up on your Monday morning or your Monday evening emergency meeting? We had approximately 35 at our community, which is actually one of the highest turnouts we've ever had at any of our board meetings. Um, it was posted out to the community via email as well as a community Facebook page that we've got, and we've had no negative comments in return from any of our homeowners. Um, as far as Clear Lake Estates, uh, I want to say they had, 14. was it 14 total? 14, and once again, a, a fairly high turnout for something on that shorter notice for their community as well. And our um, the pre or the management company that runs both of those did send that notice out to all the homeowners so that they could participate if there were any questions concerns. And I will say I did participate as well in the uh, the questions from their community. And from what I heard, they they were on the same page. There were really no negative comments from anybody. So I, I will tell you this: I know we are we are all committed to we want to help. Clear Lake Estates and Clear Lake Landings. But I'm really on the fence about the $200,000 because that was never on the table together with the 600000 And we have to answer to our taxpayers. And I can tell you that they are listening and the ones that have reached out to me are saying basically that we're being irresponsible in in utilizing uh, the utility reserves that they all have um, an investment in. I understand that at, after five years, there's a payback. I'm comfortable with the payback with that of the residents, but I'm on the fence about the common areas. If you want the 200,000 included, then I feel the HOA your common area should be built. So that this way it gives us the assurance that over the five year period, we will get back in the reserves, the $800,000. Do you understand what I'm asking? Because I, I have to be responsible to the other taxpayers who are literally reaching out and saying, they understand that we need to help this community, even though it's a a, a private community in a private lake, but they understand that that's something we need to do. But I am having, uh, you know, I'm just kind of on the fence over the 200,000 because initially on the 18th, we, we had kind of said, all right, that's out, but we're trying to work with you with the 600,000. So is there some way to negotiate that? Because I feel like we're, committed to help you, but we also want you to have some uh, investment in, this, in sure. this proposal. So what I will say from that aspect is, I think that's what took place on Thursday was the negotiation portion of this. Um, but the, the negotiation took place with the mayor and you. Correct. That was not discussed correct. with us. That, that's what I'm talking about. When we came forward and said, you know, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're expecting from the HOA from the homeowner's point of view, we wanted to make sure that everything is absolutely taken care of. One of the last things that was discussed before we left at the last meeting was potentially moving forward with just the 600,000, but charging our homeowners half rate, which would completely cut that five year period back down to a minimum. Obviously, we're not looking to just have handouts handed to us and everything be taken care of, but we've also got to be reasonable in the fact that if we don't have any way of using additional water in the case of big storms coming through, whatever else, or it's going to cost us additional to be able to use that whenever we're trying to do everything we can to get that water out. And that was one of the things that was proposed. The other thing that was initially proposed was during an emergency declaration, if we had a hurricane come through, that all the meters would be ignored during that time. Uh, that was discussed that that would basically be a billing nightmare to do that from the, the uh, water department's point of view. So, that's when we decided that homeowner property, since it was, you know, a relatively small amount in this, I mean, you said it yourself, $60,000 over five years. So even that's not going to cover the, the additional $200,000.
but just because we get to the end of the five years does not mean that that money quits coming in from the homeowners. That money will be paid back in the long run. The five-year period is nothing more than that's when we're going to sit down and evaluate things. And we're going to find out at that point, are the homeowners actually utilizing more water? Are they using less water now? Uh, is the community using a ridiculous amount of water? And we do need to go back to paying that water amount so that way that those reserves can be uh, replenished. That's where that discussion came in. So that way, we, that gives us the five years to get water out of that lake because we know that we're looking at five years to get that lake back down to a normal level, even with the emergency pumping and even with the, the permanent pumps put back into place. We're 10 feet above normal right now. It, it's going to take five years to get that back down. So the five years gives us this time to come back together and say, okay, here we are. You guys have replenished 75, 80% of that money that you've spent. Our homeowners are continuing to use the same amount. The, the lake levels are back down to normal. Everything can return to normal. Or we can stick with the same plan we're at. It's just a discussion period at that point. But I feel like it will still, in the long run, the city will recoup that money, no question asked. Okay, let, let, let's have some other any, anybody were you Why, done uh, well, well, I, know, but let not, me, I know but let's, let's I, let me finish and then i will i will okay oh uh, that's i just want to share what i'm i'm kind of having to decipher here because i literally went back and i listened to the council meeting that we had for over two hours but i also made a lot of notes and i remember when you left here you were adamantly opposed to this proposal correct and so that's why it was important for me to find out well what happened between then and now and now the same proposal is coming back but in addition to the proposal is the two hundred thousand dollars and that's where i'm on the fence about um and so i asked finance to give me some numbers and so you're saying it's twelve thousand a year is not a lot but when you add up five years it's sixty thousand dollars so that is a concern for me because I want to tell my taxpayers, the ones that are calling me, no, in five years, that utility reserves will be replenished. And that's important because, it, it, you know, you're one development, but we have so much development going on. Others are going to look to us the same problem. If we have this problem, we're going to go to the city. And so that, that's my concern. So the other part that I think is missing, though, is the additional 60 million gallons that we're not going to be utilizing that can go to other areas that can be used for reclaimed water that's still an additional source of income for the city. So we're only taking into account right now what we're going to fund. The water that's currently coming into our community will no longer come into our community, which will create a surplus, which means that you now can serve additional new communities with that same water and continue to make that money from them. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Sure. And Mr. Commissioner Nestor. Commissioner sure. Smith, please. No. Thank you. Um, let me first say, uh, I, I think it was very uh, appreciative that the two communities were willing to come in and discuss, as was previously mentioned, the last commission's meeting was a lot of contentions going on in, in, in reference to this particular project and to come to this point to an agreement, uh, I, I think it's a great deal. I too received uh, some phone calls of individuals that was opposed to what we're about to do today and as well as some individuals that were supportive of what we're about to do today. And so in the process between Monday and today, I, I did some homework of my own to, to make sure that what we were doing today, as far as my vote is concerned, is uh, due diligence. And from the legal aspect was one question, uh, was what we're doing is going to set a precedence. And I've been assured that it, it doesn't. So it doesn't mean that we have to take the same action for every case that come before us. It'll be a case by case issue. The other thing that uh, kind of brought me to the decision that, I, that I'm going to make today is the fact that uh, that when these codes were put into place as far as drainage and water, uh, over a period of time, those codes are no longer really valid today because of the excessive amount of rainfall they're receiving, 
now some of the drainage pipes are not large enough, and so some things that we're going to need to go back and look at. So as a result of that, I'm making some recommendations for the Land Development Code to address that issue as well. And so uh, after doing all of my due diligence, I I'm fine. Okay. Mr. Nesta? This is uh, just a staff question. In reference to we need to have all four landowners um, agree to this. Do we have, I guess, who runs with that? Who runs point on getting those agreements, signatures, things like that? We've got the two. Right. And Do we have the other HOA a in here represented? Avian point. Clear Lake Estates? Do we have a president? Yeah. No, president. Okay, gotcha. I didn't know. And I, don't, I just didn't know if you guys were in the room. Okay, thank you. So is it is it the city that runs with that? Are we on point? Like we're point man for that moving forward, basically? Yes. If the city, whatever the city council approves in reference to Clear Lake, I'm your point person on that. Understood. Yes. Okay. And then I know there's still issues with Clear Lake Estates and their developer not turning over rights that actually owns the land on the water. Is that something we're running with too to try to figure that out? No. Is that Clear Landing? I believe this, the, the north one. I, I can Clear Landing? On the north. States. Clear Lake Estates oh, is the, the, the northern one. Yeah. Yes. So isn't there, the developer technically still owns the parcel that owns the water? The, it's the, the, the actual LLC. Usually these are when properties are developed. These are basically, um, you know, single source, one issue LLCs that are just created for this. They, according to the property appraiser, they still have title. The agreements were written so that that entity is the legal authority to sign for it. Um, so, and then my understanding is that the, the board of directors of the as association is, um, is still developer controlled, but there is an HOA. It is a incorporated, not Florida, not for profit. Um, so that, that is a legal entity. Um, and it does have a board that can, can enter into agreements and sign for it. So both of those, there is, there are legal entities that we can negotiate with and can enter into an agreements and have the authority to do so. So do we have that? original LLC's contact information? Where are we working with them? Or are you saying we don't need to because- No, no, I, provide, I provided the the agreement is the, ex, the, in order to execute it, it is the LLC in care of the HOA. Um, I provided our public works department, their, the contact, the address, the folks to, to, to have the correct signatory. So that was done. And that's at, okay. at this point, you know, can, I just want to make sure that where they, we got there. What they do is up to them, not up to us at that point. I understand. Okay. And then similarly to, to uh, Commissioner Velazquez, I mean, we've all gotten similar calls. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and just to understand, because, again, we weren't in the room on Thursday, the, the nexus or the reasoning behind not charging the HOAs, the community areas, is just so that they can pump as much as possible on that day and not be uh, – not pay an insane bill. That's the goal, right? Or that's the reasoning behind that? Well, we were, yes. when we were talking with Blanche, because we were talking about giving them, everybody free water leading up to a storm, but it would have been a, a nightmare for our, our accounting department and our, you know, our, our uh, water folks. So it, it, it didn't make sense to do that. Yeah. So this, this was an easier way of giving them some relief, but not, not making it a, a financial accounting nightmare. Sure. Is there a way, and I don't know if you guys would be agreeable to this, is if, and, and to not disincentivize you guys from pumping out, if we can take your last year or two years, average that bill out, and that's what your bill is for the next five or six years. Uh, so it maxes out. So you, I, I, I don't know the numbers. So you pump out 100000 a year or something. That's what we bill you monthly, no matter how much you, or up to that amount more so, um, to max that out. I don't know if that would be a reasonable request, but I think it balances out to make sure that we're not doing, uh, we're being smart with these funds, I guess, but also allowing you guys to pump as much as you need to without it being a disadvantage for you guys doing that. Does that make sense? I don't know if you guys are open to that or that, again, it maxes out what your cost would be and you guys are already budgeting for that annually. Correct. So that doesn't change. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it makes sense, but at the same standpoint, we're already looking at, you know, the city's going to recoup that money after the five-year period with the additional water, with the money that's coming in from the homeowners and everything else. So at that point, if that's the case, we're going to have to renegotiate that that uh, look again to a lower time frame. 
because you're talking about it's going to be basically sixty thousand dollars additional that's going to come in on top of the additional water that is going out to other communities that's still going to be you know that's not coming to us we're still paying that money and that's that's still going in and do so, we have a i guess a number for that of what it's 60, 60, 60 000 over the five years it's for 60, just the hoas um i remember there was like 60 million gallons you get a year and that's is between that, both communities yes yeah between correct. both communities so okay. what is that come out to and and that's how many acre feet richard that was was it two and a half acre feet i i could find the number i don't I, have it in front of me i'm sorry I, two or three feet i can't remember it was something like that yeah, is it it's 60 million over five years so it, it's at least a couple of feet on the lake every year every year okay I think the other yeah, question was like 1.6 feet per year. Is yeah. What it was. So. Okay. Okay. And there's and there's two things too when we're talking about these. These aren't hard dollars. I mean, we're going to put pressure on staff. I mean, we had the one applicant who talked about the pricing of pumps and the type of pumps that we're talking about and how you know he's getting pumps for much larger purpose for much lower amounts. And then combine that with the fact that it's still an open question of mine is that same applicant committed to $80,000 to us to approve a piece of business. So take this whole number, take out 80K, because if they're not offering it, I'm hoping we're looking at from a legal perspective of getting those funds. So I, I would expect that we get line item detail about the cost incurred, and it's much lower than the $800,000 ceiling figure that we're talking about today. And you know, from a volume perspective, I can't speak for the other commissioners. I've received one, one conversation with one gentleman um, opposed to this. Um, I greatly respect his point of view. We just are incongruent on this, on this topic. Yeah. Case in point. And, you know, Mr. Wilkerson did a great job. We're going to have surplus that we can monetize. That goes back to um, filling back in the expense that we're doing up front. We're going to be made whole. Um, and, you know, we're helping out taxpayers. Yeah. It's not like this is we're helping people out in a coe or winter garden we're helping uh, popkins so yeah. i mean just for a rough number i mean if you're talking about that i think it was said 517,000 over a three year period of time or four year period of time whichever the number was you're basically going to make the same amount by utilizing that water in other areas as new development comes in that you do not have to bring in that additional water so you know our residents are going to continue to pay that money towards this system but the city's also going to be making the money on the other side from the water that is not coming to us. So it's not that this is just a cut and dry, whatever we're paying, that's what's gonna replenish this. There's other avenues of income from this also that the city's now gaining that additional water as well. So you know, it, it's very likely that this is gonna be break even even prior to the five year period, depending upon how much water we have to use and everything else within the community. Okay, all right. Anybody else from public wish to speak on this matter? Okay, so we've got two Two, um, two items here. Um, one is the motion to authorize an emergency designation for public services to procure the services of Ballinger Irrigation for the design, permitting, construction, and one year of pipeline, excuse me, of routine maintenance of the alternative water supply irrigation pump stations for Clear Lake Estates and Clear Lake Landing. All right. Look for a motion to approve. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Becker. Second. Second by Commissioner Nesta. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, we have um, item number three. Uh, anybody want to speak to this item? Anybody from the public? Anybody from the dais want to speak to this one? Not. I'll look for a motion to authorize an emergency designation for public services to procure the services of stage door two to implement a temporary pumping operation intended to reduce high lake water levels in Clearwater Lake. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Nesta. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. aye. All those opposed? Aye. So the we only, have four The only one. thing I ask is, as we move forward with the expenses, is the hard numbers can yes. come back to us so that okay. we see what the numbers are. Yes. That's the only thing I ask. And just for the right, who is the NAVO on Me. that one? Okay. Four to one. So motion carries. Okay. Next up, 
public hearing ordinance number 2985. I'm sorry, you said four to one? Yes. Who was the? Me. For the? Emergency pumping. Emergency pumping. <laughs> okay. Jim? Um, okay. You, you know, sometimes I don't hear what the votes are. I said four to one. Yeah, but I didn't hear who the descending okay. vote was. Yeah, I mean, it's it's typically the case where we know why people I don't mean, lend so, a positive vote. And it's, no, it's but what that. I find interesting <laughs> is that he had the meeting and proposed it, and he's the one disapproving it. That doesn't make sense. Okay. You just beat me down to kind of say yes. Is there I any mean, particular reason why you voted it, against just, it? Just voted no. Okay. Susan, next up. Ordinance number 2985. Ordinance number 2985. An ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the future land use element of the Apopka Comprehensive Plan of the City of Apopka. Changing the future land use designation from county rural and city very, very low density suburban residential to city industrial. For certain real property generally located south of Hogshead Road and west of Hermit Smith Road. Owned by Raynor Apopka Land Management LLC and Soil Blending Properties LLC, comprising 20.15 acres more or less, providing for severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Jim, any changes? No changes. Okay. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not we'll close the public. Here we got one. Up. Dennis New, 105 West Magnolia. First off, I want to tell you that Rain or Shine, one of the companies that's doing this, is a great company, and it's going to be bringing jobs to the area, and that's all a welcome thing. But I want to ask if consideration has been given to the fact that both of the roads... Can you go back to the slide? Where the... Sure. Definitely. Sucks. Is that both of the roads that lead uh, into this area, this? where there's already a lot of commercial congestion. You, you, you got Amazon out there, you got Goya, you got several organizations. Well, I think what everybody's forgot about, and they've forgotten about it because mm -hmm. it's not in the city, so we don't pay attention to what's going on in the county, is that 441 and Hermit Smith, there's a residential area. Yes, it's not annexed into the city, but there's families that live there, mostly impoverished families, and their kids play in the street. Those roads are already overburdened. So I'm not against the proposal, really. I'm simply asking, what are we going to do to improve the road work? All right, or we're going to end up in the same area as Golden Gym. Every time something comes up on Golden Gym, people on this committee shrug their shoulders and say, oh, it's a county road. Ha, 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 ha. Well, that's bull. And this one out here on Hermit Smith? Do the people at the end of Hermit Smith even know? Because we're, we're, they're going to approve this. We're going to put semis past their house all day long where their kids are running around and trying to play. They've already got a lot of congestion out there, both ends of that intersection, because it's a 90-degree turn with two dead ends. Both ends are heavily traveled by all the commercial vehicles going in and out of Goya, Amazon, Minute Maid, all of the other plants back there. Some mm -hmm. consideration ought to be given to the people that live at Hermit Smith and 441, even though they're not in the city. Some road improvements need to be made before we do a lot more commercial stuff out there. Once again, no planning. We know growth is inevitable, but here we go again, dropping in another organization on a two-lane road. Yeah. I can cover that. Um, these uses are already there. Right. Yeah. It's a it's a pre-existing use. If you actually looked at the aerial, you'd see that these are actually already being used by that company. So they're 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 just bringing you up to speed. But they're changing the company. They're going to add to their vehicle traffic, which is already. It's pre-existing use. They're already using it the way that they want. Well, there's a pre-existing use that's under development for the people that live out here. Okay. Anybody else from the public wishes to be on this matter? Not we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt ordinance number 2985. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Nesta. 
Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2984. Susan. Ordinance number 2984. An ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida, changing the zoning from County A1 Citrus Rural and Citrus RSF 1A Residential Single Family 1A to City IL Light Industrial for certain real property generally located south of Hawkshead Road and west of Permit Smith Road, owned by Raynor Apopka Land Management LLC and Soil Blendings Properties LLC, comprising 20.15 acres more or less, providing for severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Any changes? No changes. Okay, anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt ordinance number 2984. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Nesta. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Aye. Next, next up, ordinance number 2989. Wait, can we go, hold on before we vote. Was that a, no, was that a he, nay he, vote? He, yeah, he goes so quickly, he doesn't even hear my vote. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure the record reflects the vote was four to one. No, it's not no, four to wait, one. I said in voted in favor. Okay, because that's why I wanted to clarify. Your <laughs> eye came after he asked for yeah, like sign for the other, he so it's goes, five zero. Oh. Mr. Mayor goes sometimes a little too fast and doesn't hear my vote. All right, so, so it was five zero. Oh. Yes. Ordinance number 2989. An ordinance of the city of Apopka, Florida, Amending the future land use element of the City of Apopka Comprehensive Plan of the City of Apopka. Changing the future land use designation from residential low to residential high. For certain real property generally located north of Old Dixie Highway and east of Shopkey Lester Road. Owned by Hussam Family Trust. Com comprising of 10.42 acres more or less providing for severability conflicts and an effective date. Uh, staff and the applicant are requesting that this be postponed to the or tabled to the uh, March 1st uh, meeting. Okay, did anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter, even though we're going to come on down? Cool. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Emmy Bowers, and I live at 2170 Lake Marion Drive in Apopka. I'm here um, not only in behalf of my husband and I, but in behalf of all my friends on my street, Lake Marion. First of all, my husband and I moved here and we picked our house pretty much solely for our backyard. And so I'm really concerned about this now being in my backyard. Um, our house is like all windows in the back. So I've had experience firsthand with a peeping Tom and I have a baby, so like my big concern is someone looking in my house at my child and all of the other children on our street. Um, I'm also concerned because it's going to lower our property value. Uh, like I said, it, when we bought, it was mostly because of our backyard and the privacy. Um, with this uh, establishment, we will have issues with ambulances coming in and out. So the quiet, peaceful backyard that I thought I had will now be a noisy nuisance. Um, also, my house is the house that lines up right behind where they want to put the retention pond. So that's also a big concern for me because I'm thinking about mosquitoes and my son. So my concern is what would they do about this retention pond? And I mean, I have a suggestion if God forbid this actually happens, maybe putting a fountain there. So that would help alleviate some of the mosquito dilemma that we would have. Uh, so my neighbor friends and I are all for this establishment, just not behind our houses. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Because we're, we're just gonna be, yeah, we're gonna table it, but yeah, if you maybe you can't come for the next meeting, but yes. Come on down. Okay. I'm Steve Leroux. I live in Villa Capri. I'm president of the Homeowners Association there. And we're, we're also backed up to that property. Our homes are single, you know, single homes with one story. And our concern is all the same, very similar concerns. Concerned about a three-story building. It's going to be our 
our view, the lights, all the noise, all the other things that, that have already been mentioned. So just want to express the concern of our, our community. Okay. And, and Jim, am I correct in saying they're, they're trying to work on some things that maybe will make it less impactful on the neighbors? Is yes, that, sir. Yeah, my understanding is that they're, they're looking to re, reconfigure the building and uh, increase the setbacks a little bit. Okay. So, so right now on the eastern side, it's uh, the, the proposed setback is 100 feet. Um, on the northern side, for just the, um, the, the the primary building, it's it's also 100 feet. And on the western side, it's also 100 over 100 feet um, okay. to the to the setback right now, as okay. proposed. Dennis New 105 West Magnolia. I was going to ask if consideration had been given to the people from Merrill Estates, but You've heard from a couple of them here today, and I think they're voicing the concerns of a lot of their neighbors. One, again, we're going to put this facility on a two-lane, heavily traveled road that needs improvement. I know what's going to be said there. Well, it's a state road, and shrug our shoulders and go on with it. More importantly, our lack of planning. The police department is understaffed. The fire department is understaffed. And for a residential facility like this, Rescues become complicated if they have a fire in the structure. You can say you have a protect in place practice to protect the residents in place where you combat a fire, but eventually that's going to fail and you're going to have to evacuate people. It's time consuming, it's staffing consuming, and it's equipment consuming. We have one aerial truck. Whether it's properly staffed or not, I don't know. But these are things that go back into planning. We have all these growth ideas We've had plenty of time, but we've had no planning to get ready for all this stuff. Okay. So, Albert McKimmy, 3603 Golden Gem Road. It would appear recently that there's been a proliferation of uh, multi-storey buildings. This, I believe, is a three-storey building. There's been a number of these three-storey buildings proposed lately. I didn't hear any uh, comment on this, whether this particular building had a 55-plus year community age group. Was there any further information that you can give us on the proposed uh, use of this building? We're, we're going to table it, so it'll bring, back, bring it back on March the 1st. Okay. Yep. The comment that I'm going to make is the same as Dennis New had made. You know, we're, we're not really in a position where these developers are coming along. They're telling us one thing, and then three months later or the next meeting, they're going to tell us it's for a different use. I would like them to just to be up front and tell us exactly what they're going to be doing with the building before they start it and not have bait and switch tactics every other meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Anybody else? Not look for a motion to table ordinance number 2989 for a date certain of March 1st, 2023. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Nesta. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2992. Ordinance number 2992. An ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida, changing the zoning from MUESGT mixed-use East Shore Gateway Subdistrict to PD, Plan, Dis Plan Development District, for certain real property generally located on the northeast corner of Okoe Apopka Road and Keene Road, comprising 28.02 acres more or less and owned by Shops at East Shore LLC, providing for directions to the Community Development Director, separability, conflicts, and an effective date. Jean, any changes? Um, this is actually first reading. first reading, Mayor. Oh, first, first reading. reading. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. No problem. Jean Sanchez <laughs> with the Planning and Zoning Division. This is a request to accept the first reading of Ordinance Number 2992 and hold it over for second reading and adoption. It's uh, requesting a change of zoning from T Transitional and MUESGT Mixed Use East Shore Gateway Zoning Districts to PD Plan Development, as well as the Master Plan and Major Development Plan. The subject properties are located on the northeast corner of Alcoa Papka Road and Keene Road. They currently have a future land use designation of mixed use permitting a maximum of 1.0 floor area ratio and up to 15 dwelling units per acre. 
They're, they are also currently within the MUESGT and T zoning districts. The shops at East Shore is a consolidation of four parcels totaling approximately 28 acres. The applicant is proposing a planned development that includes a mix of commercial and residential uses. The applicant is requesting a rezoning of the property to PD instead of a conventional zoning district to allow protection of the natural environmental features of the property, including wetlands, floodplain conservation, and other areas that conventional zoning district development criteria on the property would make more dif difficult to achieve. The applicant has worked with staff to design the site to locate e each type of use pragmatically and ensure its compatibility with existing adjacent uses. The master plan and major development plan propose the development of a commercial multi-tenant center with three out parcels anchored by a grocery store as well as an age-restricted multifamily complex. The proposed permitted uses include those listed under MUESGT zoning subdistrict as well as under Exhibit B of the PD agreement. The proposed and provided maximum building height for the commercial buildings is 45 feet, while the maximum proposed height for the multifamily use is 65 feet or five stories. The major development plan includes the development of the first phase, also depicted as, the, as parcel five of the PD master plan, and includes the grocery store use with a building area of 48,387 square feet. PD will be developed in multiple phases with sufficient infrastructure for each phase to stand alone. The MDP also illustrates 3.78 acres of open space and amenity for parcel five, the grocery store portion, while 3.17 acres is required. The amenity open space program for this phase includes an amenitized stormwater area. Additional minimum required open space and amenity areas will be provided at the time of development for other phases as each development application is submitted. Commercial uses are required to meet at least 20% of the development area and at least 30% of the residential development portion for open space. Access is proposed to the site on both Okoye-Apopka Road and Keene Road. Okoye-Apopka Road widening from two lanes to four lanes is under design as is a new signal at the intersection of Keene Road. Because the site will be ready before the road winding, the applicant will install right and left turn lanes at the site entrances as interim improvements. Some access will be limited to right in, right out only. Right and left turn lanes at the intersection of Okoya Popka Road and Keene Road will be installed in advance of the signal. DRC recommends approval at its meeting on January 10, 2023. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of the change of zoning, master plan, and major development plan. The recommended motion is to accept the first reading of ordinance number 2992 and hold it over for second reading and adoption. Staff and applicant are available for questions. I just uh, want to kind of uh, say that I had a meeting with the developer and the uh, the attorney that represents this. So we had a meeting. Okay. <coughs> Anybody else have yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Any any questions though for Gene? Okay, Gene. I'm going to clarify that it's holding over for second reading. Second reading to be held on March first, twenty twenty three. Oh, not okay. Not February fifteenth. Okay. okay. <clears throat> um, anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Uh, yeah, well, before that, I mean, the so as a result of that meeting, obviously, <clears throat> I, I've received maybe uh, in addition to the meeting I had with the applicant um, in representation, I probably received maybe four or five emails on this topic from residents. Yeah, five um, emails. They yeah. sent it to me, too. Yeah, so, I, I mean, all of them were in favor of progressing with this development. Obviously, one of them was very keen on the idea of what's going to happen with the Koya Poppy Road. You know, obviously the my my main focus is not necessarily you know the expand it's safety first, right? Because that that road is very dangerous from Keene north on Akoya Popka in its current form. My understanding from the applicant is both Akoya Popka and Keene are going to have roadway improvements. The four laning of Akoya Popka is um, impacted by uh, stormwater runoff. So that has to be solved for before you can expand capacity from my understanding. Um, but the signalization of Keene 
the improvements on Ecoe Apopka in that S curve and Keen are going to be done as this um, uh, development is constructed. Let, let Pam let Pam answer. Do you want me? To yeah, yeah. Pam, why don't you answer? Yeah. Thank you. Gene laid it out pretty well. We are four laning Ecoe Pop Road from just south of Keene to Austin Bay Boulevard and then the northern piece, but we're not talking about that one right now. The four laning and the signal are under design. Uh, we are encountering some issues with stormwater, and right now we're being held up by review at Orange County. So we're moving as fast as we can. Um, it, it will be four lane. The safety improvements that they're putting in place until we can get the four laning done um, will be sufficient. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to be combative. I would, this is the insight that I had from the applicant when we spoke. So I wasn't meaning to kind of indicate that we weren't mapping towards that. It was my understanding from the applicant that the improvements that were gonna come as part of this project, they were gonna do the roadway improvements, the turn-ins, center lane were applicable as part of this construction. There were some <laughs> obstacles to getting the four, four laning done north of Keene, northward, but I'm not- They're not unresolvable. It's just right. that in a perfect world, everything would be synced up. And we've been working on this for well over two years. It's just acquisition of some right away design and the stormwater is an issue, but I, I think we've found a solution. But if we can get the signal in and the turn lanes at the intersection and turn lanes into the site, it will, it will create a huge um, noticeable difference to everyone who drives out there. Right. I'll and be tell you that the traffic volumes right now, I, I know that we all want the road widened. The traffic volumes don't say that that road needs to be widened right now. So if we put these safety improvements, by the time everything's developed out there, we'll have the road widened, and I think that we'll be in good shape. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I don't know if it's just me reading into the tone, but I, I'm not pointing fingers here. I, I'm, I'm agreeing with the fact that ultimately we'll have road capacity here. In the very short term, as this is getting developed, we should mitigate the concerns that residents might have for this development by saying the road is going to be improved, maybe not expanded, but approved. Because either way you slice it, if you four lane it, it's going to be in, in, uh, in agreement with the roadway by Emerson Park. If it's not, and you do the roadway improvements as the applicant has described, it's gonna be in accordance with the roadway south of there with all of the new industrial and stuff that hasn't been improved closer to the 429. So I'm not, I'm actually giving praise <laughs> versus questioning. I, I just want it for the public to know that this is going to happen in the same time as this development. And that's, I'm getting a whole bunch of head nods from the applicants behind you. I just wanna make that clear, but thank you. I apologize. Take back what I said. I agree. Okay. Any other questions for applicant or for Pam? I, okay. I think he's doing a presentation. Oh, you want, okay. It, and uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Jonathan Hewells. I'm the attorney uh, component of our project team along with me here today. We have other members of our project team that's been hard at work, uh, including Jordan Draper, who's our civil engineer from Kimley Horn, and we have several members of the ownership team who will be developing the property from WMG, uh, including Davey Brown, uh, uh, Leah Fitzpatrick, Jamie Bennett, and Duran DeMarv. And um, we've been working with staff on this one for quite some time. Uh, Commissioner Becker, just to cut to the chase, I won't do my full presentation, but get right to your points. Your concerns and the concerns that, you, that have been expressed from the community are the same as the owner and developer. They want to have a successful project here. And in order to do that, there has to be safe access in and out and safe travel to the project. Um, let's see. Oh, is, is that pointer up here? Not sure. Okay, I'll just get to a couple of slides that may just highlight some of those infrastructure improvements that are being made. Um, this one just really talked about the economic and infrastructure benefits of the project overall, but I'll cut to the, the, 
the last bullet point, maybe come back to the, the rest, the, and, and that's the road infrastructure. As part of this project, this owner will be donating a 30-foot wide swath of property along a Koyapaka Road that is integral and needed for the future four laning. When that donation is added to the donation that is taking place across the street uh, on, the, on the west side of a Koyapaka, the right-of-way turns from being a 60-foot segment to a 120-foot segment. The city will have or gain control of those additional road segments without having to come out of pocket whatsoever, without having to uh, threaten or engage in any sort of eminent domain proceeding. That is in the coffers. Um, in addition, before the, this center opens, this developer will uh, install design and install a signal, which will not be a temporary signal, but it'll be the permanent condition mast arm signal that will accommodate the four laning when it, it, in fact, that does become a reality. Uh, in addition, along with that signalization will be improvements made to the intersection in the form of turn lanes, both on the Keene, point, Keene Road approach, left uh, southbound and northbound turn lanes, as well as on the Okoyapaka Road, there will be a southbound turn lane on Keene Road. In addition, as part of this project, both road frontages, both on Keene Road and Okoyapaka Road, are going to be effectively redesigned, reformatted to accommodate safe access to this project. And what that really means is the current condition on both those roads along the frontage of this property is two-lane segment uh, about 22 uh, feet in width. Uh, I have a, a, a illustration that examples this. So the, the top illustration is existing condition on a Koyapaka road. It's a 60-foot right-of-way. As you know, Commissioner and other members of the commission, uh, it's tight uh, along the frontage today. There is a curve there. What happens in the after effect is what we believe is, is a vastly improved interim condition in the form of that width now adjusts from 33 to 44 feet in width of road. Now, two of the, some of that is going to be turn lanes either on the northbound approach into the project or from the southbound approach into the project. But it will have a different feel. We believe it will be a much safer condition than what's out there today. And that is just every, Every uh, access into the project, and there's three on Okoyapaka, and there's three off of Keene Road, will have both turn lanes from both approaches. And so what it, it's going to look and function vastly different in this interim condition uh, from what it is today. And we believe it's going to result in a safer condition. As Pam did mention, the traffic study does show that, you know, the, the, at least the volume of traffic today in the standards that by which the city has to apply to review of those traffic studies, that the, the road is functioning at an acceptable level of service today, and it will continue to do so in after condition. That's not good enough for us. We want to improve and need this road section to improve for our project to be ultimately successful. Um, happy to go through my whole presentation or just answer no, questions that, that come to that up. Point, that, uh, can we flip back over to the staff presentation real quick? Uh, the, the staff one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. There's a, there's a good slide, and it's it was your first bullet on there, and I know that's something that's it's a priority of PAMS, and it's to the benefit of the city, is the uh, right-of-way dedication. The On slide, it's the vicinity map. It's just the dark. Um, I'm not even sure which way you want to go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, vicinity on the, on the left-hand side, <clears throat> north of where, so north of where you had the dark shaded boxes, right? Mm -hmm you can see where the four laning roads occur, right? Because you see the properties don't go all the way to the center like they do on your property. For us to be able to four lane it like those roads up by Emerson Park North, we have to get that right of way dedication. If you weren't willing to do that, if Pam wasn't willing to ask you to make sure that you did that, we would have to pay for that, right? That's money that comes out of our, out of our bank account, if you will. But you are donating that to us for the benefit of future capacity on this roadway system. And that's a kudos to staff for doing that. And thank you to the applicant for having that because that allows us to have the long-term success. Otherwise, 
you can see on this map, it's very stark that we wouldn't be able to do that. So. Uh, that's correct. And, and between the donation being given by this property and in, in, that's shaded and the property across the street that's already come through for development review and approval, the right of way is with matches. And I will tell you, at least I, from this project, that donation is not insignificant. It equals up to about a half acre, half acre of property, uh, prime real estate, it's frontage, and it's being donated. So it, it is, a, we think it's a win-win, but certainly a benefit to the city. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, anybody from the public wish to speak on this one? Well, it's a good presentation by the developer, and they have a plan to help with roadways and everything else. But still, the city has an understaffed police department and fire department. More importantly, and they got the right slide up there, all of the design and engineering that went into Clear Lake Estates and Clear Lake Landing and Avian Point and the Central Florida Expressway when they blocked the water flow to Lake Apopka, all of those things led to a landlocked lake flooding and endangering residents. This development here, all of the water from the paved roadways and parking lots and all of the rooftops and everywhere has got to go somewhere. And they have designed retention ponds, just like all the people at Clear Lake did. But there's a landlocked lake just to the left of there. Now they have a, to, to the north of it, above the red lines, there's a landlocked lake. They have a retention pond on that other development, but with another landlocked lake there, where's the water going to go? Sure, they have dry ponds, and they have wet ponds, and they have a plan. But what's the plan going to do to that landlocked lake? Where's the city going to stand then? If the engineering is not looking into where the water's going to go when their retention ponds are full, we're going to have another problem. And that's one I brought up before when they were changing the zone. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hay. I'm from Emerson Park. Um, I'm here on behalf of my husband and myself. My husband is an Orange County principal. Um, he was the principal at Rock Springs Elementary and brought that school from a C to an A in one year. He's since moved on to other schools in the district and is continuing that success. Um, I know many of you received emails this week uh, pertaining to the new shops at East Shore Development. You can thank me for that. <laughs> I put a, a quest out there. Um, so, like many of my fellow neighbors, we've got a couple here, we are in favor of this development and Emerson Park began, we are right here off Alston Bay, directly north of this development. So we began back in 2007 and our neighborhood stretches from Ocoee Apopka all the way to Martin Road. We're 500 homes strong. Um, we were here before the hospital, before the Martin Apartments, one and two that's now under construction. Hilltop Reserve, the private school, and the 414 exit off of Martin Road. Um, we are conveniently nestled between the 414 and the 429 exits, yet at either location, we are surrounded by homes, apartments, and warehouses. And instead of getting off these exits where we would to go home, we go to West Road and Ocoee because that's the closest place to shop. That's where we get our Mexican food, our pizza, our Starbucks, all our groceries. We, as a community, like I'm gonna quote Kyle Becker, um, he said that there's approximately three people per home. That's 1,500 people in our development that are not spending money in Apopka. Because when we get off the 414 to Martin Road, there's absolutely nothing there for us either. It is just nothing. And we've been sitting out there since 2007, and we really, really, really want this development to happen. Our community needs some help. We're continuing to see growth of a new apartments coming in, both right next to 429 and across from 429, sort of catty corner to us. But yet, there is nowhere for these new residents that are coming in to shop. There's nowhere for them to get groceries. We really would love somewhere to stop and sit and eat. <laughs> so... We are hoping that you guys will please let this pass, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Public, okay. Not, um, look for a motion to approve Ordinance 2992 at first reading and holdover for second reading and adoption on March 1st. 
So, so moved. It's got a motion by Commissioner Velasquez, second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2993. Ordinance number 2993. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City of Apopka by amending Chapter 22, Capital Facilities and Impact Fees. Article 4, Water, Sewer, and Reuse Capital Facility Fees and Fund, se Section 22-97, Water Capital Facility Fee, to establish water capital facility fees. By amending Chapter 22, Article 4, Section 22-98, Sewer Capital Facility Fee, to establish sewer capital facility fees. By amending Chapter 22, Article 4, Section 22-99, Reuse capital facility fee to establish reuse capital facility fees. Providing for codification, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and setting an effective date. All right, Vladimir. Good afternoon, everyone. This item is not exciting as the previous one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long read for Susan, but uh, <clears throat> we're bringing to you uh, the request to accept the second reading of ordinance number 2993. Uh, the City Council accepted the first reading of this ordinance on January 18, 2023, and this ordinance will be replacing Ordinance Number 2474, which was adopted on February 17, 2016. Any changes? No changes. Okay. All right. And when are y'all going to bring the stormwater back? I know we... Uh, we were discussing sometime in March, I believe. When? when? March. March. Okay. Okay. All right. Super. Thank you. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt ordinance number 2993. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Velasquez. Second. Second by Commissioner Nestas. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, <laughs> ordinance number 2996. Mike. Ordinance number 2996. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City of Apopka Charter 42 Miscellaneous Offenses by creating section 42-2, trespass warnings on public property, providing for codification, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and setting an effective date. I just want to clarify for the reading, that was chapter, not charter. Don't want to make people think we're amending the charter by ordinance. <laughs> and there are no changes. No changes, okay. Any questions for Michael? Anybody from the public? Come on down. Yeah, I just realized it. It's not so much about the uh, Albert McKimmy 36036 Golden Gem Road of Popka. It's not so much about the ordinance for trespass. It's about what I believe is the misrepresentation of facts that the city attorney continues to give us. At the last meeting, uh, I believe Michael Rodriguez uh, said that in order to record in city property, there had to be uh, dual consent. If there's dual consent, did anyone here today give permission to be on, on camera? There is no, as far as I'm concerned, right for, for, for the city under Mr. Rodriguez's is, is, uh, articulate uh, interpretation of the law that you can record me tonight. I haven't given consent. If you check back the minutes, his exact words were, you need a dual consent in the city of Florida to record. Do you, do you want to? No. That's all I have to say. It was just a question. It, if he's going to tell me one thing in walking here. Walking into a, and participating in a public hearing, you're, giving, you're basically inferring consent to be... Um, you're aware that the, the meetings are taped and videotaped, and your participation constitutes consent. Per, uh, forcing onto someone to be videotaped while they're work, the courts, the federal courts, have deemed that that interferes with the productive work of government, and local governments can regulate. It becomes a time, place, and manner restriction. There is no fundamental right to unfettered access to government buildings. That is established federal jurisprudence. 
So because there is a, it, it is one city hall is a limited public forum. Therefore, the city has the right to impose reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions in regards to its operation of its business, uh, its operation of its building, and also the efficient working of the business of government, which is conducted at City Hall. Therefore, that, and the issue though is this isn't even germane in essence to this ordinance. This ordinance is if someone is coming in and is, const is either harassing our employees, interfering with the performance of government, that the city may then at that point, once you become someone who is harassing, who has become unreasonable, and because the city does have the authority to put it, to impose reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, that you may, the, a, a, such a person reaching that level may be then issued a trespass warning. But this ordinance does not regulate conduct within City Hall. This is just not germane to this discussion. I accept that the, 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 what we're saying today isn't uh, with respect to trespass, but it's still the fact that you give me information at the last meeting that I disagree with, and I'm here to challenge you on that. As far as I'm concerned, the Constitution affords me the right to record any interaction with a public member. My contention is I don't have the benefit of a stenographer. So in dealing with you, or dealing with Jim here, or dealing with the mayor, what well, proof have I got that you've been inaccurate or that you're lying to me? I mean, with due respect, you twist the words quite a lot. It's not that long ago that Nick Nesta asked you about, uh, I think, uh, a meeting that was had, and was there any information on it? You denied it. So, you know what? How can we hold you accountable if we can't record what you're saying? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this ordinance? If not, we'll close the public hearing for a motion to adopt ordinance number 2996. Just make sure that I'm not missing that. I mean, that's not explicitly stated within this particular. No, that's not, it. that's not and, an issue. And my at all. assumption is nothing that we would put into this, if we're preempted by either state or federal law, that's a preemption that this would not. Now this this challenge. this ordinance is a mechanism where if there is a violation of the ordinance or violation of the code, there's a mechanism for the for city officers to issue a trespass warning. This ordinance doesn't regulate any type of conduct within within city hall. Go. Okay. okay. Look for a motion to adopt ordinance number twenty nine ninety six. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Nesta. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2997. Ordinance number 2997. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City of Apopka by amending Chapter 42, Miscellaneous Offenses, by creating Article 7, Public Order Offenses, to regulate standards of conduct within public places within the city of Apopka by amending chapter 46, Parks and Recreation, section 46-4, Hours of Operation, to provide for notice by amending chapter 46, section 46-6, General st Standards for Personal Conduct, to provide for additional standards in public parks, providing for codification, providing for severability, providing for complex, and providing for an effective date. No changes. No changes. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt ordinance number 2997. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Nesta. Second. Looks like by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, Blanche. Good afternoon. Resolution number 2023. Dash 03, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2022, and ending September 30th, 2023, providing for a budget amendment. Thank you. Um, before you have resolution 2023-03, FY2223 budget amendment number nine, this item includes the items that were presented to you today um, for 600000 um, coming out of utility operating reserves for the pump for Clear Lake Estates and Clear Lake Landings, and another 200000 
coming out of the utility operating fund reserves for the emergency temporary pump for Clear Lake and Clear Lake Landing. In addition, we have the 800,000 that was on the consent agenda for the um, CDB block grant phase two for the CRA sidewalk project, totaling $1.6 million. Any questions for Blanche? Can you can you give me the total again? One million six hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. Any questions? And, and my only ask would be: Should the cost for the pumps and the cost for the emergency pumping should exceed that eight hundred thousand dollars? If that would be brought back to us, I did yeah. say that when yeah. I approved it that. Yeah. I want it if, if any if it once the hard numbers come to present it to us. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Commissioners, we cannot exceed this amount. All right. Okay. All right. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve resolution 2023 03. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Nesta. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, public comment. And before we start that, um, and I had this conversation yeah. with um, staff on Monday, you know, back in 2016, um, I think Commissioner Blasquez and I would have been the only people on council at the time, but there was a, a resolution or policy passed around the public comment period. Because that prior to that meeting, public comment was at the end of the meeting. Uh, public comment period was four minutes. Um, there was a suggested change to put it towards the beginning of the meeting and reduce the public comment period of three minutes. I argued that fact. I kept it up four minutes, but bottom line is public comment period has been at the front of the meeting ever since then. So I was surprised to see that it's at the end of the meeting now, and I just wanted to know what the driver of that was, and is this in violation of our policy at all? Mm -hmm. I can only answer as to the violation of the policy. The resolution, the wording of the resolution does not, the resolution itself does not set in stone when the items or what items are going to be on the agenda and when they appear on the agenda. The wording of the resolution simply states that public comment follows presentations. Um, interpreting it that it comes down to follow. Uh, the resolution does not say immediately following presentations. It's just that it's any time. It's it's following presentations, so it's inferred that it means it's after presentations. With that, and then it has the caveat or upon a decision of the city council. I would interpret that to mean that if the city council wishes to change that, it's it's present its location on the agenda in relation to presentations that would need to require a full um, decision by the council. But because the term is just it's following presentation, so the, the interpretation and the rendering of that is as long as public comment comes after presentations, that is yeah. what the wording of the resolution is. So, so I'll, go, I'll lean to the agenda clerk then maybe to answer the question. Say that again? Well, the agenda clerk being Mr. Bass, why, why was the change made? <clears throat> the mayor sets the agenda, and so um, if... if I'll, I'll be happy He'll to be the one who it, it, It's staff driven. I mean, we, we stayed here until 1.15. Staff had to wait and wait and wait and wait. And they've got families. They've got, you know, they've got to get up the next morning, go to work. And here we are. Uh, they're spending, obviously, you can see all of our staffs now back doing their, their, their job. They don't have to stand around and wait uh, to put their, their agenda items on the, uh, up for, approval and so it just it was staff driven not staff driven it was mayor driven to give them the opportunity to get back to work and uh if they have no reason to be here so that's so, the reason so if staff leaves the building and i know that it's been um practice uh, you know sporadic practice but if someone comes in here like the gentleman that came and spoke about sidewalks on rogers if staff has left the room, and I don't see Ms. Richmond in here, um, and he has a concern that we want to address at that point in time, if staff is no longer on presence, what, what customer service have we provided to a taxpayer? Um, if we all remember on our hierarchy within our budget, our residents are at the top of the food chain, so to speak. Um, they should have their right to be the first on the dock. I, I, you know, do I like 
where some of the public public comments go at every meeting? No. Um, do I think, you know, do I feel bad for the development community or applicants that are here to do professional business and some of the, you know, some some things that are said? Yeah, it, it doesn't put us in a in a positive light necessarily. But again, we're all up here serving people, our residents, and we've got to they're they're who put us up here. So I don't know why we would change it all of a sudden. I mean, you've been on in the seat now for almost five years and you just now assess that this is a more efficient process? It's not not any more, well, it's efficient for better efficiency for our employees, yes. Okay. Um, maybe maybe you can read the policy. I, I don't yeah, I was gonna ask you what, what that yeah. ordinance is or policy, just yeah. so. <laughs> I mean, it's long, but the, the whole thing is that it was established to at least address some of the concerns and some of the concerns is the decorum usually that goes on that's basically the main thing but as the chair he really can determine the you know the where how the uh, public comments go i mean he has he has the ability as as the chair the mayor uh because it says here section six standards of decorum and it lists, you know, personal attacks and insults, questions directed to the council, disruptions and decorum. Those are already in place that would govern how we conduct our public comments. Um, I just feel that at the beginning, there was a time when we did this where we would make the announcement and that would be the chair. And that would be section one, page one, right at the bottom. It says, at the start of each meeting, the mayor may in the mayor's discretion, make any of the following announcements when the mayor calls for the meeting to order. Please turn off all your cell phones. If you wish to address the city council this afternoon or evening, please make sure you have a car, uh, filled out a card with your contact information and present it to the clerk. If you have requested to speak when your name is called, please proceed to the podium and speak clearly into the microphone stating your name, address of, uh, for the record, organization, if any, and whether or not you are a city resident and direct your comments to the city council, not to individual commissioners or other members of the public. Please observe the general rules of decorum and civility. Speak one at a time, avoid personal attacks, avoid shouting, speak only to the issue at hand. So if we were to, if, if the chair were to present this before public comments, he is setting the tone for what public comment should do. Um, and it's right here. I just feel that uh, without notice to our public and without notice to each of the commissioners, to have changed the location of public comments was um, it didn't give anyone any time to at least say, we understand the reasoning for it. Um, and you're right, we, we want to be considerate of our staff, but as, as Commissioner Becker points out, when you look at the organizational chart, guess what? People of the city of Apopka sit right on top of all of us. So we owe this, the, our residents and our taxpayers the respect of giving them the opportunity to have public speak, public comments at the beginning, the way we had it, what we've been doing all along. And that's, that's where I always feel that we do things. We do one thing for all this time, and then all of a sudden we change the, the, how we're going to play, you know, play the game, how we're going to conduct the meeting. So um, I just feel that we let it go today because I didn't want to make an issue at the beginning and bring this up, but now that we have it at the end, um, I'm going to let the public speak and say um, how they feel about having public comments at the end. And certainly, if we are going to change this, then we make to, we need to make some sort of amendment to the to the resolution. We make these resolutions because they guide us. They guide us on how we govern. Um, and so, if it has no value, then we shouldn't do a resolution. That's all. Okay. Thank you. My, my only comment is, is that I've heard it both ways, yes. that some of our residents don't think it's fair that they have to be here at the beginning of the meeting in order to speak, that 
they should be allowed to speak at the end for various reasons. Some of them work or whatever the case may be. And then when I look at it, it says that it's supposed to be submitted prior to the start of the meeting. So it, it, it's a catch-22, uh, like I said. Some residents like the fact that it's at the end of the meeting, it gives an opportunity to get here. And they don't have to be here at the very start of the meeting. And some prefer uh, it's at the beginning so they can say what they have to say and, and leave. So it's... Yeah, I'll, I'll make my young Sheldon comment, as people like to call me. Um, the, but the point being is, like, even when this was changed back in 2016, there was a normal course of business that residents and people that attended these meetings knew was going to happen. When you do it under this pretense and, you know, you don't tell anybody about it, it's just kind of everything's changed. Why would we not have a formal conversation as a council? Because you know that this is going to raise eyebrows of people. Why, why is this all of a sudden changed? Um, and we do have this resolution on file. And the spirit of it, even though it may not say immediately following, but it, at that time it was meant to change it to the beginning of the meeting. And so, hey, I'm open to the conversation. I don't think my way or the highway, but it should be one of these things that ideally the board of this chair would say, hey, by the way, come next meeting and, and appreciation of staff's calendars and schedules. We're going to be changing public comment period from the beginning to the end of the meetings so that we're all aligned and we all have some sort of say in it and it's, you know, blessed and we move forward. But, and you know, we still have some residents here if you want to hear yeah. well, the, their, their opinion. That's right. Commission Velasquez said. Okay. Public comment. Public comment. So I have one that uh, Steve Larson. I think he, he already spoke. Didn't yeah, he? he, okay. He, he's, he's the one that spoke on the. Um, yeah, he put it on the green one. Okay. On the one that was tabled. Okay. Yeah, he was oh, on Via Capri. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so um, then we have Michael Duran. Dr. Rand Claremont. Good afternoon. So the long awaited Gannon report is out in draft form. And no surprise, the city continues to hold this to the last possible moment and continues to push back and refuse to accept accountability. Mind you, the city hand selected this company to complete this holistic review. The report is full of city failures, but I can only speak on a few. Gannon reports levels of liability to the city are high with unqualified staff performing building inspections and delivering training, training that Austin did not get. The city attorney comments on this statement as a legal falsehood. Under Florida's waiver of sovereign immunity, local governments may be held under tort law for harms resulting from government failures to fulfill mandatory functions. Is training of our firefighters not mandatory? Gannon reports, there, are organizational, there is organizational unity in the shared grief over Austin. Other than that, the department is dysfunctional in many key, er, key areas. The city attorney rebuts, the statement is not properly defined in order for proper legal conclusion and analyst to be made. Was Gannon asked for legal conclusions or just to evaluate the department? Gannon reports, it is accepted that a firefighter's role will be exposing them to danger and unpredicted situations responding to emergencies in the field, but not at a fire station where workplace safety should be exemplary. Fire staff's comments, 
comment is subjective. Only narrative, only negative comments published. How is this subjective when in the fact that Austin was killed by the lack of safety and training at the station? The city attorney comments in this statement said it's not supported by factual data. The mayor is right. Facts are a funny thing. Austin's death was a direct result of lack of training and safety at the fire station. Gaining reports, major issues with health and safety at the AFD can be summarized as follows. Years of neglected safety and health programs, attention towards safety and health. Fire staff comments, what is used to reference years? How about this? The amount of years that the sand trailer was used and never once was anyone actually ever trained on it. These are statements that the city attorney wishes to strike from the report and I won't allow it. These are from the firefighters in your station that you employed, that you hired. There is a serious disconnect between admin and district chiefs. We need to be more involved in planning for changes that can affect operations. Current SOGs are long-winded, outdated, and need a total overhaul. Definitely a contributory factor of Austin Duran's accident. Training standards are unacceptable and contributed to Austin's death. We need real training division. Safety concerns have been known and ignored by management for years. No one in management has ever been written up or held accountable for Austin's death while others get punished for minor issues. Admin says they have an open door, but we know if we are seen walking through that door, we will be labeled and treated as troublemakers. The city attorney questions whether these interviewees were properly advised that their statements are now become written public record. And he says, which could be eventually attributed to them. Is this a passive aggressive threat? It is no wonder that the fire administration is unaware of the culture of the department. There is a fear of retribution from management towards staff who speaks out against practices and decisions. Many members are afraid to contribute to this review and those that did needed assurance that their comments would not be attributed to them. Fire staff's comments. Again, these are serious accusations that the AFD takes serious and ones that we would never ignore. We have never received a complaint regarding this statement, even when numbers, or rumors rather, such as we have developed a mentorship program, which of course is what we pushed for. The Fire Staff Administration has heard because I have told them. They have heard because the firefighters come to me rather than them. I received a text message from a firefighter literally this morning. And the message reads, crazy part is admin sent us an email telling us to talk with them, Gannon. It would be anonymous. And then the report says that they need to tell them who said those quotes, probably so they can retaliate. It is extremely important that the comments that are made by our firefighters is taken serious. And I don't really care about any repercussions or legalities, proper language, or words that somebody feels may not be appropriate in a government report. 
These statements are coming from your firefighters. And I want to stress to you guys in the most heartfelt way, and everybody literally in this room, every fire person in here, myself, my family, you and your families, Marion County Fire Rescue. They have to mourn a second firefighter's death due to suicide in just one month. Are you aware? A pocket fire in this entire city must take what is in this Gannon report to heart before we suffer another tragic loss. Instead of worrying about proper language and trying to avoid accountability and responsibility, we must focus on our men and women that we employ. Thank you. Okay. Before we talk, talk further about anything, I need guidance from you. Like the report that we were all sent yesterday afternoon, is this fall within the realm of what we talked about in executive session because it's not specific to the piece of litigation. I just want to get clarity there. The report, the draft report, I think it's important to note in our conversations with Gannon, I'm not going to go into the subject matter of the litigation or the accident, but Gannon told us when they sent the report, oh, this was just for you guys to review and go over and it was you know, almost treating it like a questionnaire when I had to advise them, you're aware under Florida law, the second you handed us that, that draft report, it's a public record. Turns out Gannon has never done a review of any Florida fire department or any Florida local government, so they weren't clear on that. As to the subject matter, because the report kind of d d skirts around in slaloms and, and, and dances on touching issues regarding the accident and then the overall department and then back to the accident. A lot of these things are intermingled. Um, so it's, I, what did our special counsel say it. on this? What did our special counsel say on this? What did they advise? No, they advise the same advice, the same advisement I've given. It's, it's still we're, we, the, we cannot discuss issues relating to the litigation. If you want to discuss the holistic issues overall of the department, and we're not within those fact patterns that are germane to the litigation, that's within your purview as the local government. But those issues that are raised uh, and statements that can be made or inferred from the report that are leading to some type of opinion or comment relating to the subject matter of the litigation that that's the I mean, it's a fine line and it's 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 really a muddled gray area that I mean we've got to kind of need to be careful in regards well, to well, those we need to make the decision because we've had residents that have sought public record of this report my opinion and I'm not the clerk but in my opinion the draft that they sent is a public record not a version that has fire response legal response the draft that they sent is a public record, and that has to be delivered to the people that's requesting this public record if you don't think it has any bearing on the litigation in its purest form. It's the, hey, if there wasn't proper due diligence done to say, hey, this should not come through the formal channels that makes it a public record prior to us having a conversation, that's not a fault of the person seeking that record. So it's a separate record of the one that we received because now it's littered with the fire department's remarks, your remarks, and then we can't clearly see what's going on there. Second point, and Mr. Duran touched on it, is there's a lot of strike throughs on the verbatims, the quotes from people. And if they were given certainty from their leadership that they were to remain anonymous in these reports, they sh damn well better be anonymous because that is, that is the worst kind of misrepresentation. And I'm hoping that's not the case. Because if you sit there and, and people are trying to be honest about their opinions about the station and the department that they work in, and they're going to get thrown under the bus in terms of identifying who they are and map to what comment that they made, that is unprofessional to a T. Okay, I, I'm, are you inferring it, the basis of my comment? There's and I that, that ask specifically who made this comment. I, if I will address my comment, and I address this directly with Gannon, my statement was 
did Gannon advise the, uh, the firefighters or any of the staff that their comments would be publicized, printed in a report that was going to be a public record? I am looking also for the concern of the firefighters because they can speak on the condition of anonymity. Gannon could make a, can make a conclusion based on their quotes without actually putting the quote verbatim in a report. At that point, that, if that quote is verbatim in a report, it is outside of the control of anyone for any other person, a person, or I, I can't control who, to try to identify who that is. If I give, some, if I give a statement in, in, in anonymity, hey, this is what I'm going to say, and then my statement appears on paper for someone to be able to infer, hey, look, hey, buddy, I see your, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking kind of loosely, but hey, I see your quote made the report. Well, did that person who gave the, the quote, was he fully cognizant of the fact that what I'm going to say is going to appear verbatim, sure, unattributed, but verbatim in a written report that's now a public record available to the entire public? That was my concern. That's the concern I raised with Gannon. I wasn't looking for, hey, who said that? That's inappropriate on my, on my behalf. I'm actually looking on, on for the protection of the privacy of our employees. Did this entity be aware that they're going to put unattributed quotes from people in a public document that could be easily, that's going to be disseminated to the public? That's, that's something of concern. You're, you've made your point three times already. Right, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm, you, I'm just trying to reiterate where, are, whether you're inferring that I'm out to look at who, who that either either there's, fire staff or the legal department is looking to see no, who who said sir, the quote. Sir, there's notations in the document that ask who made this quote. Who who said this? So, if that's not your intent, those that's the that's also not that, my statement. I did not ask who made these quotes. There is a statement in the report that we received on one of the pages that says who made this who made this comment. Every single quote in the report has been struck through. So. I'm assuming the intent is you're going to tell Gannon that in their final product, that all quotations need to be removed. Now, unless someone can point to the statement of work that says uh, quotes will only be source citation or things like that, I don't know. I got the, the statement of work uh, this afternoon, so I need to read through that. I haven't had a chance to yeah. do that yet. Um, but if we are not going to promote that these things are going to remain anonymous if they were in fact told to your point in all fairness to your point that Gannon said, Hey, we are going to use your feedback to write specifically what you said within this report. Okay. Let's, let's run that to ground. But if they were under the mindset and they told people that when they were doing their interviews, that you are, your quote is going to be represented in the report of findings. Those people should remain anonymous if they were in fact told that they were going to do that. They got that instruction from the admin. Um, but you know, with, from a timeline perspective, I know that you all have had, you've mocked that up or major notations. When are we going to get a final report? When are, because in the statement of work, I did see something where Gannon said that they were going to present this to us as a, as a body as well. Is that planning on happening? When is, yeah, he's, he's in yeah, Indonesia or yeah, it's a, somewhere? it's, a, um, the two, the, Folks who drafted the report who we spoke to, and we spoke with them on Friday morning. They were actually en route to Thailand where they had a project, and I don't know how long it was going to be before they actually got back to the U.S. to then address the um, our responses and the feedback, which is what they solicited as part of the, their submitting that that draft review to the city. And so, so and I, 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 can I just interrupt here real quick? Because public comments have been waiting so long, and I'm sure we were all going to address this during our council reports, can we let public comments still happen and then – I don't mean to interrupt, just to everyone's point previously, they've waited quite a bit. Sorry. Okay. okay. Alex Klepper. All right. Well, I'm going to continue to talk about the report. So um, let's talk about it since it has to do with, you know, safety and safety is supposed to be our number one priority in the city. I hear that constantly. Um, I can resolutely say I've never been more embarrassed and ashamed reading a document in quite some time. And that's saying a lot because I read a lot of embarrassing things um, over the last year. Um, it's unacceptable. And I have access to a dictionary if anybody needs to define that term because that's what we're doing is just 
piecemealing sentences word for word and saying, how does this word use? Give me a... <clears throat> Chief Wylam and Mayor Nelson handpicked this professional organization to review this fire department. We're told our own people weren't allowed to perform any review or critique because industry leading subject matter experts were conducting them instead. Gannon Solutions was part of the ad hoc committee that Chief Wylam stated he put together. Um, Anyone want to believe us now that that was only in an effort to exclude his own safety committee, or are we still just going to continue to change the narrative as it comes out? Um, subject matter experts rendered their report. Suddenly, this company has gone from experts to enemy number one for exposing the reality that the rest of us live in. And we're to believe Chief Wildman and Attorney Rodriguez are now the subject matter experts for how to run a fire department. Um, through the assistance of Chief Maynard, who I do commend for his efforts in this, our firefighters were, in fact, encouraged on multiple occasions and even offered overtime to meet with representatives from this company, Gannon Solutions, and we're told, your participation is an important part of this evaluation and will give them a better understanding of our department and a plan for important next steps moving forward. Now that the truth's come out, our chief wants every single employee comment stricken from the record that's what we're just talking about here, right? Um, one of those things, this place is still North Korea. That was a comment that was put in there that's not attributable to anybody. Um, <laughs> every single comment we're going to strike from the record because you're worried about us. I have had so many complaints on my phone. You know what not one of them has been? That they published our words. Because every time we try to speak, it gets silenced. Everything that we do tries to suppress anybody else's narrative other than the one from City Hall and from Fire Administration. That's it. Um, usually, and I was, I was kind of looking forward to this report because usually it gets this, um, misconstrued as, oh, it's the union and there's just a couple guys with an ax to grind and this isn't the opinion of everybody else, right? This is just, they've got an angle. What angle did this company have that was handpicked? Not by us. My membership was pissed off, frankly, when we found out, oh, they just picked some guy. This wasn't put up to bid. There was no information. They, oh, they picked this guy. Um, you know, the rig is set. Um, <laughs> I mean, at least we can put to bed the, the blindsided narrative. We're clearly choosing to wear a blindfold. Um, we don't want to change. We don't want to come together. Unless come together means agree with only us. Um, we want to check boxes. We want to hide or avoid anything counter to the narrative provided um, that everything's fine and adequate and oh, we're working on a plan. We've been working on a plan for everything forever. And, you know, it's just we have to come in here and scream and shout every other week. Um, I mean, the responses in this report were clearly written reactively out of fear rather than understanding. Um, and out of all the comments and questions I received, from our firefighters, um, one of the most common ones was, who is our fire chief? Is it Chief Nelson? Is it Chief Rodriguez? Is it you? I just, we have no sense of where this is coming from, why it's gone the way it's gone. Um, it's, you know, to use the term that was questioned for a definition in that report, it's this unacceptable. What, what else could we possibly do um, except the Lauer report from a third-party company that they chose industry leading subject matter experts they gave you their opinion and then we decided to pick apart what does the word unacceptable mean what is the you know who wrote this do not strike those quotes from the record and if you want to you can go back and ask him what were mine exactly and I hope my statements are recorded because none of our guys are concerned about that. They're happy that the truth is out there, that somebody finally is advocating on behalf of our firefighters and not just trying to cover and hide and change the narrative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dennis New. Dennis New, 105 West Magnolia. Good afternoon. 
Again, this afternoon, I've seen multiple zoning and approvals without proper infrastructure in place. The city has an outdated traffic plan, an outdated infrastructure plan, understaffed departments, including the fire department and the police department. Is anybody on the commission listening to the taxpayers? Is there some unseen or undisclosed financial drive to multiple people or just one person to push to continue to overburden this city? Growth is inevitable. This fact's been known for years. Yet here we are with an understaffing issue in multiple city departments and still approval after approval. Now on to the important part. Florida Statute 633. Florida Statute 633 is a state law that governs the operation and implementation of a fire department safety committee. It was discussed on social media and published that a paid investigation of firefighter Duran's death was returned and the city attorney and the mayor, along with the fire chief, contested portions of the report and wanted them redone or removed. Is this like paying for a survey for apples? The apple that wins is the highest bidder? You get what you pay for, or is the truth what the city is really after? NIOSH is working on their investigation. The state fire marshal's report has been done and was contested. Where's the transparency on those reports or the first drafts? Why pay for a third party investigation if the fire chief, the so-called city attorney, and the mayor can contest what is reported? Narcissism is a rule, cast the blame, blame everybody else but where it lays. Why not just save money and put those three in a room and let them write whatever they wanna to write to sugarcoat the issue and attempt to protect the city from liability? Why the gag order on city employees? Is the city too afraid to admit that Mr. Wylam, while training officer, stressed the importance of the training on the sand trailer? Yet when promoted, did away with the training officer's position and forgot the department rules, he had a part in writing in regard to the trailer. Why was it put back into service after it had been emptied and stored in the garage across the street? It's time for answers, not for evasion, not a conspiracy to cover the truth. Why is it that the city attorney gave, in my opinion, poor advice to the fire chief in direct conflict with state law? to dissolve the safety committee. Why did the chief, you call him chief, it's a term of respect after my career in the fire service, one I'll never address Mr. Wylam with. The state law is clear. A safety committee is made up of fire department members, not an ad hoc group made up of the admin's picks to continue to evade the truth and responsibility. The failure was this city's. The failure was the person in the chief's job and apparently a lower chief officer as well. Stand up, accept responsibility, ensure that proper training and safety practices are in place in the fire department. The city promoted those two positions from within, continuing the quote, established culture, which has now been clearly proven to be a culture of demeaning treatment, poor safety and training, as well as poor leadership. It's time to fix it, not to hide about it. The Duran family, the fire department and the taxpayers deserve better. It's time to fire Wylam. Albert McKimmy, 3603 Golden Gem Road. You know, I look around me tonight and it's a great deal of sadness that I feel. I see that firemen who depend on each other, who have been brothers all their life, now are committing suicide. There's all sorts of things going on and I can't understand why. Everyone I've spoken to without fail has said, going back, Chief Wylam, was a great firefighter. What's changed? Why are people unhappy? I provided the uh, commissioners and the mayor and uh, the, the, the city clerk with a document which is dated August the 2nd, 2017. It was documentation prevented, presented by then the fire uh, 
training officer, Chief Wylam. In that, he documented the requirement for training. He documented how it was to be carried out in rotations through the different stations. He obviously had a great appreciation of the need for safety back then. Why today, as a chief, has he relinquished the position of a training officer? Why has the culture in the fire department changed? One of the gentlemen over there, I think, hit the nail right on the head because he addressed the, the mayor as the chief of the fire department. I believe that a lot of what's gone wrong in this if this community is based on budgetary restrictions and it's a culture that Mayor Nelson puts pressure on anyone and everyone. If they don't adhere to what he wants, then the door's over there. Uh, we've seen that on numerous occasions with, with all sorts of things. I think the first thing that, that I would suggest is we need an honest mayor. And, and until we have that, Nothing's going to get better on a pop car. Can, can I just address uh, one thing? And that is that, you know, I have received uh, emails from Mr. Michael Duran and uh, Austin's mom. And one of my concerns have been that they feel some frustration on public records requests. And not only do they feel some frustration from it, um, the indignity of not even responding to them in, uh, in a response just to say, you know, we have your request. Um, either we can, you know, fill the request or at this time we can't. And, you know, I did speak to the city clerk and uh, I understand that um, she was counseled that she was not to respond. And so I'm asking the attorney and the chief administrator, when someone is emailing or comes into our city hall to ask for public records, um, we do respond. And so, I felt an obligation to respond to both Ms. Gail Duran and Mr. Michael Duran to let them know that there were, that we were counseled through the executive session that we were not uh, to discuss or kind of have any inquiries. But I just feel that if they are asking for public records, if they are contacting our staff, or each of us, that we should be responding to them out of respect and giving them whatever the reason is that we cannot fulfill what they are asking for. So I'm asking the attorney, uh, as I did with the city clerk, to please respond. And just as we would anyone, but not to respond and be silent, I find is a disrespect. To clarify the issues. For starters, I cannot ethically directly respond to either Mr. or Mrs. Duran. They are represented by counsel. The rules of the Florida Bar prohibit me from speaking to them without, their, without speaking to their counsel. I have to speak to their attorneys. I was actually on the phone with one of their attorneys today in, in addressing and, and taking care of an issue. So I cannot respond to them. There can be well, no communication, no co telephone calls from my office to them directly. I'm prohibited from doing so. Okay. I cannot speak for the communications that come from the clerk's office. But just to clarify, I cannot respond by email directly to them. That okay. is against the rules of the Florida Bar. Okay, that's fine. So but as they for- they were not asking you, uh, from my understanding from their email, they were not asking you directly, they were, doing, as they always have done, was to ask for public records through the city clerk's office. That goes between them and the city clerk. Was she told not to email back or wait no, for your it, response? No, it wasn't or? no counsel. counsel. Excuse me, no. counsel. I, excuse, right. I, I, with, with all due respect, um, Commissioner Velasquez, I do not appreciate you belittling my job by putting my work in quotation marks. 
I, I, I at least because I request I request to... that respect okay. as you're considering what my role in regards to the city and to your council is. I I I, I wish to, to to receive that respect. Okay. So the advisement has been the, as for the, the to my knowledge, the last documents that were produced that were requested, there has been communication between the clerk's office as to what the um, those documents, how many were received the clarification. I believe we actually responded today to the final clarification. The, the records request was an oral records request. So we have to compile the records based on what was transmitted orally to the clerk's office. We have been compiling the documents and, and making sure that these are documents that do not have any exemptions or are consistent with the public records laws of the state of Florida. I think today we actually did respond. We did submit the response back from the clerk's office to just clarify, does, is there anything else? Can you please clarify so that when we do produce all the records, they accurately reflect what was requested. So that's the, that is the last, the one request that was made for documents, the most recent one that I'm aware of. And I mean, I don't want to speak for the clerk, but I know that we, we, we did respond. The clerk's policy is when a request is made, that they, they acknowledge the request is made and that there, you know, there'll be a reasonable time for the documents to be gathered. Um, and there was a follow-up done today to make sure that we have what was requested correctly, that we didn't miss anything because it's not something where you can go to an email or a letter and just check off, okay, here it is, here it is. This was something that's, you know, based on a phone call and notes being taken and things can be missed when things are, are, are delivered orally. I think we were also requesting to make sure we had some type of written confirmation that the documents that that the request would be you know completely fulfilled that's to my knowledge the last of the of the records requests that was done we were still in the process of compiling and re and reviewing the records to make sure that those records that are sent are consistent with chapter 119 and that, that we do not um produce information that is exempt under florida law from, from public records. There are exempt documents and it's our obligation to review to make sure that we don't inadvertently um, produce exempt documents. So that's to my knowledge, that is at least in this case specifically where, where we're at. And I can let the clerk confirm that because that's within the purview she of the clerk. Did. She did when I went spoke to her this afternoon because I, I actually went to her office in response to the both emails that I received from uh, both parents where they felt that they were not being responded to. Um, and they felt that they were just being ignored. And that was the word that they used, okay. ignored. I, 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 I can emphasize and I can't feel it, but that's an issue between the clerk's office. Um, that's out of the clerk's office. Yeah, here, here's a more direct question. Uh, clerk Bone, when you receive a public records request, do, do all of those public records requests have to funnel through the attorney's office? Okay, so even outside, and you have general knowledge of Chapter 119 in terms of what should or shouldn't be divulged in terms of that, that state law. And I can certainly appreciate anything that comes across as it relates to the litigation that we all are talking about at this point. But the fact that every single public records request has to go through our attorney's office, I think is the point that Commissioner Velasquez is making. Shouldn't have to. I, I don't know why it does. I, why that we, we, she, our clerk has a skill set that she knows public records law. So why would she not have the complete authority to satisfy public records requests? I don't authorize what records are reduced, and, and the clerk can confirm this. The attorney's copied as, as a public records um, to review and, and, and to pinpoint. However, I don't tell her, okay, now you can release. Okay, don't release this. The Her clerk phone. sends a copy. I had, it, when I when you say you. funnel through, it doesn't address, go through my department. Mr. Rodriguez, I'm addressing Clerk Bone at the moment. Um, <clears throat> if you were to satisfy a public records request, would you send it to the general public prior to you getting approval from our city attorney's office? Um, essentially, if I if I send it out. Send it out to the department that is going to fulfill the record, and then I can get it out. Okay, so if if someone were to, you know, I, I, I'll 
his name will remain nameless, but a, a gentleman that does a lot of public records requests. <laughs> does, does his re request go through your department, always go through our city attorney's office first before replying back? And well, is that yeah. at the instruction of anybody on staff or just your own safeguard? What, what's the driver of that? Okay, so if, if you immediately... Susan, is your mic on? Sorry. So if you immediately cease that practice, you would be okay because you, you as the records clerk mm -hmm. or custodian can reply back. Yes. So we're all sitting up here generally not in our head to say it doesn't need to go through the attorney's office at this point. Now, obviously, if it's the one related to pending litigation across the board, obviously that becomes a different story. Um, but I, I'm just looking at you for general guidance as so I, I can convey to the general public yes. what our process is. Okay. I, I know the process. Mm -hmm. yeah, got it. And when someone comes into City Hall, they don't have to identify themselves. I mean, that That's is correct. what I learned through ethics, That's my four-hour ethics that I take every year, correct. is that someone can come up to me as a commissioner in the street and say, we want these public records, and I'd have to come right. to you and say I had a request, and I am not allowed to ask that person who are they or why do they want them. No, I can't ask them their name. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, does, that, does that public record request have to go through the attorney before? How does it work if someone comes in anonymous and says, well, I don't want to give you my name, but I would like a public record, whatever it is, I that's not involved in a litigation what is the process so if they don't want to give if they want to do it anonymously they would then be told that they could check back and find out if the records request is ready for pickup and then they would be given a cost of how much that would be if there was a cost for production of copies but the 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 other thing that i just now that we have this new way of coming into uh, city hall where we have to provide some kind of identification, that person really isn't anonymous anymore. Right, and but they can also make a phone call and, and do it that way. So we have had people call and we have had people come in and verbally do it. So I could take a verbal on a phone call or I can take a verbal on somebody just coming up to the counter. And I, and I would not, they could Technically, before the system, they would have remained anonymous. But yes, you're right. They, they do have to provide their, their ID to get in. Okay. But that wouldn't prevent you from going. If push came to shove, they truly wanted to remain anonymous and they wanted to submit a public records request, you could go out to the reception area, talk through the glass, and as if they were in your... Oh, in yes, your I, could. Right. I could do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the only thing I ask is, is uh, you know, when anybody, that we treat everyone the same. And so my concern was that the Durand family felt that they were being ignored. That, that's my only contention, was that everyone else gets a quick response in acknowledging the request. And, I mean, I get them all the time from Susan when we are copied. And she immediately responds by saying, we've received your request and she's working on it. But that wasn't occurring with the Duran family. And that's why they uh, reached out to us because there was some kind of frustration upon them that why, aren't, why isn't anyone at least acknowledging that they were asking for these records? And they understand that it's under litigation. They know that we had the executive session, but I still feel that when they write an email for public records, that we respond to them in the timely manner that we do everyone else. That's all I'm asking. And my understanding was that uh, the city clerk was told not to respond. So how did she get to tell them that she did receive their request? But again, what I'm understanding we're, we're is that- We're conflating issues here. The city clerk was never told not to respond to acknowledge the, the oral request. There was an acknowledgement yeah, yeah. via email when the request was initially made. 
So she was never directed never to never to even acknowledge receipt of the request. That that just did not happen. Well, he we we fulfilled a part of it, and and there's there's still a, a balance that needs to be to go through. So that's okay. where we're at with that. And we did send an email this morning to, about that. Okay. Good. All right. Any other public comment? All right, city council reports. Commissioner well, Velasquez. Oh, I don't even know what I have here. Wait a minute. Um, not much other than that when we had our um, South Apopka annexation, um, I just want to comment to uh, the residents who did come out to the John Bridges Center. Uh, thank you for coming out. I, I got to hear, um, of course, uh, a lot of sentiment, some criticism, and um, we are still working uh, with that South Popka annexation. And, uh, you know, we're still looking for uh, more participation. And, um, you know, I, I, got, I took away a lot from that, uh, that meeting. I hope that the next one that we have uh, will be done in a, a time frame that would be um, accessible for everyone who wants to attend, and certainly on a time on a day that the county commissioner is not uh, holding her own council meeting, because it is important to hear from the county uh, rather than uh, providing all the data that we did, um, and they did not get, we did not get to hear from the county. And I think it's very important. Part of the South of Popka annexation, they are the one. Uh, the county is the one that is at this time. Um, kind of paying the bills and taking care of what South Apopka needs. And so we need to hear from the county on the, if we go ahead and make another workshop. Uh, I feel that we need to have the county sitting at the table so that we can understand um, what they provide, the services they provide, what it costs, and what it would take to, you know, turn over uh, South Apopka to the city. Um, I think that's important because we, it was all really one-sided. It was just everything that it would cost in order to uh, absorb the South Apopka. Um, and it, we didn't really have any uh, feedback from the county. That's it. Mr. Becker? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, first and foremost, uh, happy Black History Month um, starting in February. Um, yes. We have a very diverse community and it's to be applauded and appreciated. And, Yes. Um, secondarily, uh, Mr. Patton, I didn't see you on Monday, so I've got some sample economic development director position um, kind of job descriptions that I would like to hand off to you, as well as I would encourage the rest of the commission to do the same thing. Um, but, you know, to Commissioner Nesta's point, I tabled and yielded during public comment, but I'm going to yeah, sorry about the that. issue. Thank you. Um, and, you know, beyond, and I apologize because I know that there's a fire department training update coming up on the agenda. Um, and it's unfortunate that the timing of us getting this report is less than 24 hours of this meeting. So I apologize. Uh, it's raw to me and I'm going to react to it. Um, the, and I'll try and be as respectful as possible to our attorneys, um, you know, counsel around <clears throat> the pending litigation, but there's a lot in there that's not contested. Um, in terms of facilities, in terms of current conditions, past conditions. Um, granted, we, we're going to have a training update and life safety update, but there's a lot of things in there that are, are not contested. And how they got to that condition, how we're communicating what we're doing to resolve those issues. You know, every, every budget cycle that I've set up here on, on city council, I ask the same thing of director staff. Even when we were doing the, the Camp Wee Law expenditure of, to the tune of $4 million and such, do we have any critical needs across the departments that would preclude us from making these types of spends that are viewed as kind of luxury spends like Camp Wee Law? And it's always with a resounding, no, we got everything covered, budget's great, and this, that, and that. And then you look at this report, and you got, you know, every, every station house, even Station 5, for Pete's sake, has some material findings in terms of, um, and that's a brand new station as of 2019, I think. Uh, station four, again, we've touched on it before. We haven't really talked in length about it, but I think a lot of us took site visits to that location. 
Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm no mold expert, but there's mold present. There's violations in terms of that report around the hood not being over the stove and cook area. Um, yeah, there's some cosmetic rips and in insulation, but that's kind of tertiary to me, you know, mold being the most important. Um, so we can, we can spin doctor this thing all, all, all we want. And like even the notation in the report talking about understaffed in the facilities, you know, two people down. Um, yeah, we can say that it was outside the scope of that report, but facts are facts, right? Uh, if we're down people in facilities and we're not able to address pressing and safety needs within our facilities, it's something that we need to know as council and react to it. I mean, I, I don't want to wait any, anymore. <laughs> what are we going to wait for? Is this to be cleaned up, go through five iterations of back and forth? I don't think you should say that. I don't think you should say this. There's some pretty material and damning findings in this report. And what are we going to do about it? Yeah, we've got a training officer and a life safety officer, but the, the, there's a lot of things beyond that uh, that need to be squared away quickly. So what's the plan? I mean, you've, the mayor and staff has had this report for quite some time. What's the suggestion? Let's listen to the chief. I want to know your suggestion. You're the leader of the city. What, what is your <laughs> point of view? You, each meeting, granted, you can, you can argue back and forth of whether or not people that talk during public comment or, or, or talk frequently at, this, at the city council, if you agree or disagree, fine. But this is a department within the city that you manage. You've seen this report. What do you want to do? I haven't, I haven't read the whole report. You haven't read the whole report? No. Are you kidding me? No. Are you serious? <laughs> that is a punch in the gut. And I don't have any other words to say tonight. Mr. Smith. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that, that this is February 1st and the beginning of Black History Month, and that uh, we do commend all of our soldiers that have gone on before us that have paved the way uh, for Black history and support all the activities that will take place during this month of Black History Month. Uh, in reference to the meeting that was held uh, for the annexation of the unincorporated part of Apopka, uh, I'm suggesting that we schedule another meeting date uh, for another meeting uh, that would be at a time, uh, six o'clock as the resident suggested. But I will also would like, uh, if it's legal, uh, for the council to vote to show that we support the process of annexing South Apopka, uh, unincorporated parts of Apopka, and to let them know that we are serious about what we are talking about doing. And then a plan is put into place in order to uh, make that a reality if that's what the residents of the unincorporated parts of Apopka would like to do. Uh, I've read the report. Uh, There's some things uh, that I will wait until the report from the uh, Fire department is done in reference to the update uh, and that those uh, things that are within our scope of doing that, that they are addressed. That's all I have. Commissioner Nesta? Uh, just want to say we're celebrating Black History Month, obviously. There's a lot of good events going on in Central Florida, uh, so make sure you're attending those. Um, wanted to jump into Economic Development Department. Uh, went over to City of Sanford last Monday uh, to uh, meet with their economic development director, uh, meet their department, and then also uh, go to their city council meeting. So learned a lot just how other cities, a very similar city to ours, um, similar age, size, um, both in population and geographically. So I, I like to use them somewhat as a rubric. And, and so I had a really productive conversation with their economic de development director, Tom Tomerlin. And uh, I would suggest you guys all reach out as well just to talk to him, kind of get an understanding of that, uh, of how they run their department. It, it's very successful. I have, he was in um, Lake Mary at one point and created an incredible brochure that he gave me of just kind of how he um, took that city and, and designated different sites and things like that and just how they marketed it. It was really uh, unique and, and selling the story of what Lake Mary could provide. I mean, that was before Verizon was there. He was instrumental in bringing that. So uh, 
just really cool conversation. It can really show, and it's really exciting to be kind of on this ground level to create the department that we want it to be uh, for the city. So I would definitely reach out to him. He also provided me with um, Sanford's actual kind of state of the city, th- uh, showing their economic development department, their metrics that we're able to um, track and things like that, which I thought was really cool uh, to be able to actually have uh, accountability on that and see how it's tracking. Um, so I really liked that. They, their budget, I, I, I just thought this was interesting. I brought their whole budget. I reviewed it again, just to see how it kind of goes with ours. Um, they spend $600,000 a year, which was an 11% increase from the previous year. So um, although they're going through very similar staffing issues, they go through very similar um, fire department issues. They actually have only four fire stations, whereas um, uh, we're, we're definitely ahead of them on that front. Uh, they decided to, to increase their budget another 11%. So they obviously find value there. Uh, in that department uh, year over year. It's not like they just gave 600000 and and that's it. They, they are continually increasing that because they find the value, which I thought was very cool. Out of that, too, they spent about 250000 on outreach programs um, meant to educate and attract, which I, again, it's just, it's, it's very cool what they're doing up there. They have a specific website that I thought was really cool, too, that shows all of the proposed construction, under construction, things like that, that the Economic Development Department created. So, Again, it's just, it really just refines the process for the city of, of how we uh, conduct ourselves in business. And I really like that. So it was really exciting. I would definitely recommend, and I can give you his contact info, uh, of reaching out to him, just have a phone call. I met with him in his office, but whatever you do, I would definitely reach out. I think it's productive uh, and, and um, they have a really cool department there. Something else I learned uh, meeting with the city of Sanford is that they actually have, um, they have late meetings. So it starts at seven twice a month um, each meeting. What I like that they do is that they have a workshop before every meeting. I think it's a little much for us if we do that just once a month on our late meeting. I think that would be productive um, just as a council that would help kind of shorten our meetings so that my council reports aren't as long. And uh, it would also just give us a little more time to have some dialogue. We could also throw in instead of kind of pushing out like another annexation workshop, we can throw that in as we need to um, versus scheduling out two, three months, whatever it may be a month. It, it lets it, we know we can fit it in the next workshop. So I like that concept and I, I don't know if you guys would be open to that or, or just, you know, think about it. Uh, it's a recorded meeting, so it's, you know, Sunshine Law protected. We can talk about what we need to and, and I think it would just help to promote uh, the city more, get, get some of our ideas, understand our agendas and our goals and, and work forward from there. Um, additionally, similar, you know, last uh, council meeting, we had about an hour long special session or a private session, which a lot of people were sitting here. So for those scenarios that don't happen as commonly, but do happen, it would, we could throw that on that workshop time frame. So just some ideas to help uh, kind of bring us into a, a, a little better oiled machine there. Um, additionally, what's something I really like that Sanford did on those late night meetings, um, they provide dinner for their staff. I, I think that's a nice, um, a nice thing to do because especially with the last meeting. I mean, I think that was just a shocking meeting for a lot of people that we lasted that long. So to help the staff be here as long as they are and with how long-winded I am, I think it's beneficial to provide them some kind of dinner if we can look into that. Um, also, so, and, and Commissioner Becker, I appreciate last week too that, uh, or last meeting, or the previous one, whichever meeting it was, that you had kind of gave some detail on the process that it took to get an item on the agenda. So. What I would like to do, and I, I spoke to our staff about this as well, is get a formalized process in place of so there's no ambiguity of how we can get that process moving forward so that whether it's us voting in our council reports or how we move forward, just again, it, it eliminates that ambiguity and we can then move forward with whatever it may be. Again, it, we kind of use what's in that workshop and then formalize it in our council reports to just keep things moving. I think it just it, it will create a lot more synergy up here, uh, less silos and, and just a lot more work moving forward. Um, the only other uh, thing is just uh, at the last council meeting, although it was 1 a.m., I'd asked for this Gannon report and didn't get to last night. So we need to figure out uh, why that took so long um, when we had it. I, I don't know if there needs to be a, I need to do an official vote or what that needed to be, but that was unacceptable how long that took. Um, and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. That's it. All right. Chief, come on down. Give us the fire department training update.
Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, members of the public. <clears throat> Sean Wyland, Fire Chief, Popper Fire Department. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, meeting with myself and my staff uh, earlier this week, going over some of our um, updates for our safety and uh, training report. Um, first uh, thing we want to cover is our new hire orientation. Uh, as we spoke uh, with you guys earlier this week, we have 15 new Firefighters going through orientation uh, start on January 17th, and they're going to conclude on March 24th. It's their graduation day. They're going to be going on shift on March 26th. Um, I have also have uh, Chief Knapp and uh, Chief Maynard here with me today if you have any further questions on any of this stuff. But um, the orientation is going very well the first two weeks, as we discussed, our uh, HR related, a lot of the uh, getting the paperwork out of the way, getting them orientated. Uh, one of the new programs we just start was a robust uh, driving training uh, program. Uh, the, the firefighter recruits uh, were oriented with uh, the ambulances and, and drove around um, doing different courseworks and things like that. Um, so we are going to be starting new, 15 new firefighters. Uh, our recruitment is actually going very well. We have a, a, another recruitment project tomorrow at Seminole State uh, Fire College, which we're going out to... Um, Recruit new firefighters. We've had uh, nine more to get to meet our goal to uh, for the end of year 18 additional firefighters. Something we're excited about. Um, working through that, we found you know a lot of different ways to be competitive. One of the things we've we've learned is that uh, uh, different departments are offering jobs right then and there, um, and we kind of come up with a similar program. We're, we've been working with Joe Patton to figure out how we can do that. If we have a candidate who is Something who we're really excited about, calling it the golden ticket. But if someone is we're really excited about, we want to be able to offer them that job, you know, contingent on, of course, passing school and and then completing what they're going to be doing. But, um, station updates again, in order to effort, in an effort to properly accommodate for the new hiring staff, we have gone through um, upgrading the stations and have input requisitions and purchases of all needed equipment, such as beds, lockers, um, things of that nature, the gear make sure that we're ready to go on day one when we uh, implement the new people on, on March 26th. Uh, SOG updates, we're cur currently performing a risk analysis and updating all of our SOG SOGs based on NFPAs, uh, 69A of the Florida State Statutes and other applicable um, industry standards. And this is something uh, we actually have uh, an employee off duty who is going through each and every one of our SOGs Making sure that Chief, there were Chief, you're going to need to dumb it down for some of us on on oh, your I'm sorry. acronyms. Yeah, okay. uh, standard operating uh, guidelines. Um, the so we have someone who's uh, looking through those, making look from a risk management standpoint to make sure that we're identifying those and making sure we're lining up with uh, all the proper codes. Another uh, exciting venture we're taking on is uh, firefighter fitness. Um, one of the things that we have, one of our goals we have in mind is eventually become NFPA 1500 compliant, which is, is the safety compliancy. This is a very large undertaking. One of the part of that is uh, being uh, 1583 compliant. Um, engineer, uh, one of our engineers came to me, um, Cody uh, Bennett, and wanted to take on this role. I, I wanted to encourage him to do that. He wanted to uh, establish a fitness training program within our department. Um, again, uh, an effort to accomplish this uh, goal, he has completed IFF uh, Wellness Ambassador Program. Uh, he's actually completed his personal trainer course, so he's now a personal <coughs> trainer, and the final steps of uh, completing his nutritional courses. Um, again, this establishes uh, he's going to become our wellness coordinator, um, outline uh, the requirements. Big thing, too, is uh, workout and safety equipment within the stations. We want to make sure it's all adequate and safe and consistent. You know, you have different stations who have different types of workout equipment. We want to make sure, and he's got to head all that up. We're also going to be doing an um, annual fitness test uh, to assist members in making future health and wellness decisions. Um, again, also some of his roles are going to be providing educational materials, PowerPoints, et cetera, that promote general health and fitness and provide fitness programs through higher approach to all members. Um, again, we're hoping that this is going to be uh, successful. We know it's going to be a successful program. We're looking forward to uh, Cody taking that on. JPRs are job performance requirements, and it's something we talked about a lot uh, 
early this week. Um, we're currently creating evaluation criteria for certifications in all job-related skills. One of the things we want to do is break down each part of our job on a small on a small scale and break those down into these JPRs. Um, basically, there's the three cr critical components. Um, there are the tasks to be performed, the equipment or materials that are, are provided to complete this task, and establishing those parameters and performance outcomes uh, for those specific tasks. Um, again, kind of can we kind of explain by doing this, we're going to be able to qualify our members and quantify um, how people are are performing. Um, with that, you know, the training training chief's job now will be to kind of dissect that and look at areas that we need improvement on. And by being able to break down those step by step bases, um, we're going to be able to do that. This is a again an undertaking. We're working our way through it, but it's something we're currently working on at this time. Uh, another uh, exciting thing: uh, Fire Department Safety Officers Health and Safety Conference. Uh, two of our members, uh, Chief. Uh, Chief Mannard and uh, Lieutenant Brown um, attended the FDSOA Health and Safety Conference um, in St. Pete. This conference had, conference had over 300 attendees uh, uh, from FDNY to California, Seattle, Hawaii. Uh, while they both attended, they actually attended the two-day Health and Safety Officer Academy. Um, both these individuals are already state certified health and safety officers, but this kind of um, this uh, particular class qualified them to become nationally certified um, pro board health and safety officers. And it's, uh, um, you know, some of the course highlights with that, are again, they're introduced to emergency services, occupational safety, health specific uh, jobs and tasks, risk management, pre-incident safety considerations, um, post-incident stress management, all things that we're, we're looking to improve on. Uh, some of the recent training courses, um, the big one is our trailer and training operations. Um, on July 12th, 2022, we announced the establishment of a trailer committee to research and develop an SOG for trailers and towing. On 27th of uh, July, the committee was created and contained members of all ranks. That's one thing we want to make sure we're doing is covering all ranks. A draft SOG was created and the committee began discussions um, with the FWC, um, Florida Wildlife Commission. That's one of the... Um, agencies in the area. One of the big things when we started looking at, at SOGs specific to trailers, very far and few between in the fire service as a whole, we found that the FWC, um, by the nature of what they do, trailing boats, bear cans, um, all kinds of things where they operate with trailers on a significant, um, on a constant basis, um, we thought it would be good. We reached out to them and they have a very robust uh, training, training program. Um, while we're waiting for this to come to fruition, uh, uh, Chrissy Fixel with our risk management also passed along a webinar to, to the committee specifically regarding trailer loader and transporting. Um, because of this train to trainer opportunity, we were able to, we were able to um, uh, go through. And one of the biggest, uh, the, the, mem the member of the FWC who was providing this training was actually deployed to the hurricanes. So we had to wait a little bit, and the, but the day he got back was the day we actually we're able to perform this train to trainer program. Um, basically, uh, you know, understanding that, understanding too that we have sent our entire department through this training, um, but it's not something we're forcing on people any, either. Uh, just because we want everyone to go through the training and be comfortable with hooking up a trailer or you know, certain tasks, but just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it. And or if you're not competent, we're certainly, you know, we're going to not allow you to do that, or to perform that. Um, also understanding just because we've sent everyone through this training doesn't mean that the services based on those trailers are going to come right back into um, service as well. So more training is going to be coming as we evaluate and implement these specific services. Everything solves uh, for the fire service train to trainer program as well. Um, this, uh, this last week, uh, five department members participated in training at our training center. Um, we had a uh, member of Orange County's uh, special operations team come out and train our personnel. Um, this individual is a guru when it comes to SAWs. He, everything you can possibly want to know about a SAW, how to operate, he, he knows. Um, it was a 10-hour 10, 10 blended lecture and hands-on class, and it prepares our department instructors um, 
to be able to pass on that information uh, to, to the rest of our firefighters. That's something we're gonna be implementing very soon. Um, again, what we're gonna be able to do once we have this established as well is the training chief's gonna be able to incorporate now SALS into every part of our, 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 our training, what is vertical ventilations. VES is Vent Inner Search, it's just an acronym that we use for our types of search we're doing. Uh, bar uh, removals and softening and structuring, et cetera. Um, traffic incident management systems. Again, our new hire orientation uh, participated in this. We uh, actually had a district chief uh, who was uh, a train and trainer in this already, came to us and said, hey, I think this would be a good idea to implement for the whole department again. It's been a few years since we've, we've done it. Um, so through this process, um, he actually was able to meet and one of the interesting things, you know, what we learned was the Road Rangers is a big part of this, actually um, come out of Cooper Commerce, which is very local to us. So we have a direct connect now with that. And we're even looking at ways to implement them into our dispatch. And traffic incident management deals with highway responses and things like that to make sure that our members are safe. Um, and again, working in or near traffic. Uh, again, this program is scheduled to be taught to the entire uh, fire department annually. That's something we're rolling out right now. Um, along with all this uh, stuff, you know, something I wanted to kind of pass on uh, to, the, to the council and to the public. Um, on September 22nd of this year, um, I signed us, our, our department up to be a registered agency with the CPSE, um, which is Center for Public Safety Excellence. Um, one of the biggest things I think that I want to do in the future is move forward and get accredited. I think accreditation has a lot of value for a department. I think um, other things we reached out to um, is the Commission on Accreditation of Ambulances, CAS. Both of these things are gonna help us not only get to the future, but help us reevaluate on an annual basis and keep that, that cycle going. Um, and uh, one more thing, I do have, wanna introduce uh, one of the new members of our staff uh, who's here today, uh, Chris Candy. Stand up, he's our new, uh, yeah. He's our new EMS quality assurance specialist. Um, we actually grabbed him from Orlando Fire Department, which is, uh, sorry Orlando, but I'm excited <laughs> to have him. Um, he is uh, doing an excellent job so far the first four weeks. We're getting uh, a lot of uh, information from him. You know, statistics we're gonna use f moving forward and want to use this for our accreditation processes and as well as uh, improving our, all of our responses when it comes to the EMS, so thanks Chris. And with that, any questions for the chief? Um, I, I know that, first of all, I do want to thank you for the time that you did give each of us to go over this uh, new safety training um, that you have put together. Um, and I, as I mentioned to you, I, I was very impressed with uh, the detail and how you are moving forward with the new firefighters and it's from the very start, rather than, you know, kind of, dealing with, oh, we just realized they didn't understand something. Mm -hmm. But from the very start, to, to train them mm -hmm. and for them to understand what their, where their job duties are. So in that, I will say, uh, you know, thank you very much for doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what I'm concerned with, though, is we have 15 new that are being trained right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe you told me that they're scheduled to uh, kind of graduate and go on to the different fire station yes, by the end of March. Yeah. So my concern is the condition of some of our fire stations. Mm. Um, they need to be addressed before we send these 15 out. Um, with, that's one thing I don't feel that we should continue to wait uh, until the next budget. Um, I, I really want to send these 15 out into stations that are fit for them. Mm. I mean, all around. Um, I know that uh, Commissioner Nesta has made several trips to uh, Station Four, because I've made a, you know I've made three, and and that's really in bad condition. I didn't realize Station Five was having some issues. Mm. Station Three, which is the one on Wakaiva, yes, ma'am. Yeah, that one they've kind of outgrown what they you know their personnel there, uh, two of course. So we we have some issues with the station houses. So. If we can work something, we have all this time sure. to try and address some of the major 
uh, you know, uh, problems that we're having there, you know, with the structures. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, you know, I, I would be remiss without thanking my staff because, you know, all this stuff we're talking about, they've, these guys have been working their tails off to, to uh, get a lot of this accomplished. So it's, it's a group effort for sure. Um, and specific to the stations, I'm going to actually have uh, Chief Manor, if you want to come up and speak to that. We're, we've uh, been working with facilities um, and maintenance uh, to work on some of this. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, like Chief said, we have been working with facilities. Uh, I just did uh, completed in November uh, stations one through uh, six uh, quarterly inspections, and I have a list of all the deficiencies that we have for those stations, and I've been working with AJ from facilities to get those taken care of. I know one of the things we talked about is mold and air quality testing. We have that on the list to get done for all six stations, uh, working with him on that. So anytime a repair or request comes in, we put that through a spreadsheet and get those into facilities and work on those. And also the, the inspections that we've done at those stations have that list. And him and I have been working together uh, since November on those. Uh, we have an actual way. He has a marker board in his office. I have a spreadsheet in mine. And we work on, uh, once they're completed, we, we knock those off the list. So and I'd love to sit down with you guys and show you that list next meeting if you like. Okay. Um, and the other thing with the safety training, I know that we're starting out with the 15 new, mm -hmm. but how are we incorporating any of the safety training with the existing firefighters? How are we kind of incorporating them into this into this training program? Again, um, and now, you know, Chief Knapp wants to uh, come up and speak that, doesn't look like he does, but. <laughs> um, you know, it's something where we're revamping our entire training program. Um, you know, something that Chief Knapp has looked at, and also he's broken down training specific. Uh, one of the things with, with safety in mind is these two guys are working together hand in hand, you know, and, and providing that safety aspect and making sure, and, and the chief manager's even identified certain tasks and, 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 t and topics that we want to cover specifically and coming up with a, with a a plan, yearly plan, to make sure that all these are covered on, on a basis. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> when I first started back in October, I uh, decided that we needed to figure out where we were as a fire department. And we uh, did some scenarios and figured out where we uh, lacked on force and entry, pulling hose, doing all these other things there. Uh, I would say the minimum requirements on fires. So as uh, we went through our, our training, we kind of had set up a, um, a system or a schedule where on Monday, station two would train from nine to 11, and give them a full two hours to train without having to run calls. So we kind of took them out of service, give them the two hours that they would, they would train. On Wednesday or Tuesday is station three, Wednesdays four and six, Thursdays five, and on Friday is station one. So going through all these scenarios, we kind of came up with uh, some of the things that we were lacking on, pulling hose. We just changed our hose load, so we had to come back. And I wouldn't say go back to the, the basics is the key word, but hit the basics of what we kind of determined were on fire. So we kind of started with that. Um, the last three months, we've been going kind of over all of that on uh, those days. And, this month, we're going over RIT training, which is a rapid intervention teams, which are the firefighters that are outside of a fire that when a firefighter gets in trouble, they'll go in and kind of assess the situation, see if they can get them out. Um, next month, we're going to go over Mayday training. Both of these are for getting our own people out of fire. So Mayday training is going to be how they, um, they call for help. There's a specific way you need to do it. It's not just screaming uh, for help on a on a radio, you want to mayday, 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 and then you uh, you kind of catch the, the ear of the command. And then those JPRs we were talking about, I'm getting ready to send out um, uh, five of them that have to deal with pulling hose, um, catching a hydrant, forcing the door, throwing a ladder, and doing a search. And through April, that's what we're going to go over. So it's kind of, I got to take care of these 15 new people and the ones that are out, the 119 that are already out there. So um, that's just something that I've been working on for the next three months. Um, my plan is to get a whole year of training together so that everyone knows exactly what they need to be training on and so they can focus on it from the lieutenants on down. 
Um, but that's all I have for right now, uh, training wise. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Becker. I don't think I have anything to add. Just uh, thanks to Chief Knapp and Chief Maynard for walking me through the, the presentation on Monday. Mr. Smith. And I just like to say that uh, I was impressed with what was presented and just look forward to it being implemented and just want to make sure that when we develop the schedule for the new hires that they're partnered with uh, some seasoned firefighters as well, that we don't have a complete staff of new hires that's at the station at one time. Oh, yes. Sir. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the, the, the idea is now they're going to be backwards on a fire engine from the get-go, so they're going to have a lieutenant and, a, and an engineer with them at all times. Yeah. Mr. Nesta? I uh, just want to say welcome to Chris Candy. Congrats. I'm glad we stole you from Orlando. Um, I'm kind of working back on my questions. Um, the conference that um, Lieutenant Brown and Chief Maynard went to, was that, uh, do we have budgets for that built in that, that funds that? Uh, we did, we have, where they're allowed uh, 300 each, and even staff members are allowed $300 each year towards okay. that. So. Good, yeah, I just want to make sure yeah. we are funding that well, that it's not a disincentive to go to those, that it's well available and, and obviously a value add for us. Um, I kind of have more specific questions. I should have thought of these on Monday and I just didn't. The, uh, we have a lot of multifamily projects coming up. Do we have like a specific training program for that? I mean, we probably have, I don't even know how many thousands of units coming in, so. Yeah, that was, that was actually um, something was uh, brought up during, during some of our talks. Um, and yeah, he doesn't, I don't think he wants to come back up, but. <laughs> Um, we, you know, one of the things that our training facility is as a four, you know, four story, uh, training facility, we actually do training specifically hooking into FDCs, uh, multifamily dwellings as we are getting a lot more of them, obviously in the city. Um, we do have them currently in the city. So, you know, that's something we do train on, on a regular basis as far as our responses and, and to do those sort of things. Okay. Um, in the, in the commissioner right. of last case, ask about sure. warehouses. Yeah. The warehouses, those are, you know. Yeah. Definitely a new animal for us and something that the Chief Knapp's working on um, and, you know, even reaching out to other departments who are used to those sort of things and, and getting some information. And cool. Stuff. Um, the, we just got rid of and we just approved, I think it was the last meeting meeting before, it was the meeting before, I think the first one of January, uh, getting rid of that mobile training tower. Mm -hmm. We don't need a new one of those, correct? Well, so I, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's something, you know, it's, it's not... Um, you know, critical per se, but it's something that we do utilize. You know, we uh, station, it was out at station five, rotate between station two and station five. We, I think it's something that we can um, use and something I will be asking for next year in the budget to replace that. Um, okay. I think so I had different uh, conversations that had a, that said no, that, yeah, that we yeah, don't. Yeah, do that. yeah, can we clarify that? Because I asked that pointed question on Monday. Yeah. And it's in our minutes because the mayor said that we needed to spend 275K on it. Yeah. And I got a negative response to that question. Well, it's it, again. We have the Gilliam Training Center. It, correct, and it's and again, it's not a critical component, but it's something that we we utilize. Public Safety Day, for instance, we have that set up out at uh, Jason Dwelling for for not only us but the police utilizing it. It's it's a resource, you know, that we can rotate between stations and and certainly use that again. It's but it's not needed. It's a want. Yeah. Okay. Um, and are you guys able to provide, we, we kind of took a di deeper dive in this at our meeting, just, and we, you just high level, we, and what you're doing to address mental health. I know we spoke, we took a much deeper dive, yeah. but just kind of a high level of that. Sure. Um, and again, we kind of, you know, just for, um, privacy sake, yeah, privacy sake and kind of, there are, there are certainly programs in place, uh, that, that are available to our, all of our firefighters. Um, UCF Restores, you know, being one of the big, bigger programs that's out there, um, you know, our, our EPA, um, we've been, even increased that uh, throughout, um, you know, our grieving, our grieving process with our firefighters um, and, and, and communicated that to them. So. Okay. Right. And the only last comment is the Gannon Report, it's a critique and it's supposed to make us a little uncomfortable. So I ask that you guys just look at it and take it for what it is. It's a critique. Sure. I know, I mean, I read a lot of the rebuttals that were put in there and, and I get it. It's just, it's critique, it's meant to hurt. So it's meant to make us better. So please look at it in that capacity. And, and uh, I know you guys are making a lot of changes and I appreciate you guys taking the time, not only individually with us, but also here. So thank you.
and if you would, Chief, before you leave, but uh, you know, that was one of the things I asked too was about the mental health and and tell them about the part about even when they go to the hospital, the discretion that's used. Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah. But discretion uh, is used when yeah, absolutely as needed. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. And, and next, I know you're, we'll try to do this on a monthly basis. Can you bring up? I know we had the the 25 or 23 items that uh, that the uh, I guess the union put forward that they wanted to, to address. Can we maybe kind of address those next sure. next time you come forward? That would be that would be awesome. Sure. Okay. I thought that was the fire committee, the safety committee that came up with that. I didn't think it was the union yeah. committee. Yeah. Okay. It was the committee, okay. not the union. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, Edward. I have nothing to report, Mayor. All right. Michael? Nothing to report. All right. Under Mayor's report, yes, going back to the, the GAN report, um, although I haven't read the whole report, I've spent probably four hours with the chief going line by line to make sure. A lot of things in the GAN report, like they didn't even know that we had, there were, there were protocols on the Internet that firefighters have to check off to be able to, 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 quant or to, to qualify they've done certain training. And so... As, so I'd rather go through it one time and do it right than sp speed read it and, and, and not get all the facts. So the next couple of days we'll get through the whole report and, and you'll have you know, the recommendations and, and what, um, what we need to change. But it, it, it's interesting, you know, if we want to talk about Gannon, and I'll, I'll say this, is it interesting that um, he, uh, he's willing to help us for you know, this, 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 the first agreement was for $20,000, but now he's willing to help us for 150,000 per year for three years. So that's what he thinks we need, which kind of sounds kind of out of line, but that's that's what he thinks we should be spending. So anyway, up next, um, South Apopka annexation, we talked about that. And we'll, and to Commissioner Smith's, um, we will put another one on at six o'clock or somewhere, maybe do it on a Wednesday night so that we can get um, the, the, um, uh, county commission involved as well. So Wednesday night wouldn't be a good night. Oh, that's, right. that's not good for you. Okay. Bob okay. All right. Yep. 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 All right. So we will, we will do that. Okay. Um, next up, we had a, the diversity equity and inclusion joint meeting, um, yesterday and it was, it wasn't as well attended as our first one we did. The first one we did was just city uh, bids and it was, um, it was about, so I think we had about 150 at the last one. This one, we only had about 60, but we were talking about bids for uh, not only city contracts, but some of the big, bigger projects we have in within the city. Um, next up, uh, we talked about the Kelly Park Interchange Form-Based Code. Uh, the workshop will be next Tuesday, February 7th at 10 a.m. Be a two-hour presentation. We'll have the developers and Pam going through that, that uh that report. Uh, then we have the Armando Borjas golf tournament this Saturday uh, out at Red Tail. Uh, I think registration starts at seven. And I think tee times are eight or eight thirty. And then um, one of the things we, we kind of brought up, you know, yes, it's Black History Month, and so we will by the end of next week we should have a booklet to sell, which will will we'll highlight our twenty eight. Um, black leaders, you know, throughout the ages that uh, we're, we're really excited about, you know, the, the uh, AYC put it together along with city staff and the Apopka Museum. So look forward to having that. We're going to be selling that at uh, City Hall as well as the museum. So looking forward to that as well. So with that.